Oh, yes. We sent one around. Yeah, we had that discussion very early this morning about how much time I spent here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, I'm not used to having a mic on, so my voice typically carries. So if I'm a little bit overbearing, let me know. Um, I'm Jim Robertson. Uh, we met, I think, most of you earlier this week at the opening session. Uh, and Mark and I have had a chance to visit with many of you uh, during the course of our visit. Uh, I want to say first, thanks, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, Mark and I are going to be with you through lunch and maybe a little bit into the afternoon uh, as we provide some summary uh, observations, impressions uh, regarding Grand Traverse County. Uh, but also to go back and take you through a series of uh, uh, instructional pieces around the facility development process, uh, needs assessment process, and to uh, also uh, spend some time with you and have a conversation about are you ready to take some, some of the next steps. Uh, we've got an agenda that we're going to follow, uh, but one of the things that I really want to focus on is, is that um, as we need breaks, etc., get up, take a break. If we have to do that, if there's a question that arises and Mark and I uh, are not clear, there needs to be some more information, certainly grab us during the, during the presentation, after the presentation. We want to be as uh, responsive and interactive with you as, as we can. Uh, again, I'm Jim Robertson. Uh, I am here representing the National Institute of Corrections, uh, which is a federal agency. We're going to go through uh, some introduction and presentation about what NIC is. Uh, but I am under contract to the National Institute of Correction. I am here. Uh, Mark and I both are here at no cost to the county. Uh, all of our services, our fees, travel costs, lodging <coughs> costs uh, are being paid for by the federal government. And we are only here because you asked us to come. We're not here for any other reason uh, other than Grand Traverse County said we'd like for a couple folks to come in. Uh, and to spend a few days with us and gives us an indi yeah, independent and objective quick look at our criminal justice system. My background, as many of you heard earlier in the week, is I've been in the business since 1971. Uh, Nixon was president. I had to go back and think about that because the Watergate hearings were in 72. Uh, Nixon was president when I started my career. Uh, and the reason for it, I, I mentioned that is that uh, he was very instrumental in the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration uh, and the development of the National Institute of Corrections uh, that happened and, and a lot of funding that, that came out of the federal government during that time. I've been in the business since 71, spent 16 years working in two counties uh, outside of Washington, D.C., a couple years with the Justice Department and 20 plus years as a private consultant uh, doing work with counties all around the United States. Oh, you got to have a mic. Um, I'm Mark Goldman. Met most of you the the other day too. Like Jim, I've been in and out of jail for um, over 40 years. Worked in the juvenile justice system the beginning of my career, then in the adult justice system. Then went back to school in architecture and have been studying and planning. Uh, justice facilities around the country since since 1980. Um, I've been involved in over three billion dollars worth of of, uh, of jail and, and prison and court projects. Um, again, through, throughout the country, also work with a lot of communities on alternatives to incarceration, ways to to minimize the, the number of, of beds that are that are built and help people um, change. Um, Happy to be here. We've had a had a, a very productive two days prior to today. Um, but pl please understand, as we're going through the presentation, that we've just been here for for two days, and what we're going to be sharing are um, initial thoughts. We're not there's there has not been enough study to come up with final conclusions. But but we Jim and I would both be sharing our observations, what yep. what what we've seen and what we've un understood. As an agenda for today, uh, we're going to uh, ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, oops. We're going to ask each of, you, each of you to introduce yourselves uh, and then just answer a question, you know, what's your role in the criminal justice system uh, and what brought you to today's meeting? So we want to do that. 
We'll go through the introductions. I'll spend a little bit of time and give an overview of the National Institute of Corrections. And then Mark's going to pick it up in discussing initial impressions and observations about the facility. I'm going to talk a little bit about initial observations and impressions about alternatives. We'll take another break and then we'll go into an overview of the facility development process. That'll probably take us up to maybe 11 or so in the morning. Take another break, go, to, go through a conversation about needs assessment and what goes into conducting a detailed needs assessment as we go forward. Probably then use that opportunity to break for lunch, come back after lunch, spend some time and talk about readiness, answer a few questions, and then visit with you a bit about action planning and next, next steps for your county. So that's going to be our, our, our somewhat loose agenda for today. <coughs> Uh, and we'll modify that as, as is best fitting for the audience and, and for your needs. So first, let's, let, let's hear a little bit about who you are. We've met many of you during this week, um, but, but there's a sign-up sheet going around. But just start with Todd over here in the corner, since he's trying to avoid uh, saying who he is. We're going to start with him first. Uh, introduction, your role in the criminal justice system, a little bit about... Procedure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, Todd. Uh, Todd, we're administrative sergeant in the jail. Uh, I guess my role is to uh, help operate a safe orderly deal. Uh, can you use the microphone? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It worked. Yes. Uh, there it goes. <laughs> uh, my name is Todd Ritter. I'm the administrative sergeant in the jail. Uh, my role in the criminal justice system is to help maintain and run a, a smooth, safe, orderly jail. Okay, good. Pass the mic. Yeah. I'm Captain Bob Hall. I'm the jail administrator at the Grand Traverse County Jail. Uh, what brings me here is my concern uh, for the number of usable beds that I have for the inmate population that I currently maintain. Uh, we don't have enough usable beds on a daily basis for the number of inmates incarcerated in the Grand Traverse County Jail. And I'm also concerned about the facility itself, uh, the safety of the inmates, the safety of the staff, and the deteriorating facility that we have. Okay. Thanks. I'm Sonny Wheelock. I'm Vice Chairman of the Grand Traverse County Board of Commissioners. I, uh, my first primary concern is the safety of our community. Uh, that being said, the safety of the inmates that are incarcerated in our jail and the safety of our staff is a primary primary responsibility of the county board. Uh, the we know about the failing infrastructure of our of our current facility, and trying to evaluate what the best move is to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Dave Benda. I'm the administrator controller for the county. My role is to uh, well, I'm appointed by the Board of Commissioners and uh, my role is to carry out their policies and to uh, implement their decisions. And uh, the issue of the jail is uh, a growing one for us. It's uh, becoming a financial issue for the county and I'm here to uh, you know, help facilitate the process as much as I can. I'm Bob Cooney. I'm the Grand Traverse County Prosecuting Attorney. I set policy as far as who gets charged and what they get charged with in the county. Uh, we're also the gatekeepers for uh, entry into special alternative uh, programs like the sobriety court and the domestic violence court. And uh, I'm here because I'm obviously concerned about public safety uh, and I believe that the uh, jail and the number of beds available to the judges who sentence uh, individuals charged with crime uh, is key to uh, the uh, the safety of the public and the administration of justice in general. Okay, thank you. I'm Danny Brown, uh, the facilities director. I try to keep the old dinosaur running as much as possible. It's a huge task um, given its age and whatnot, but uh, I have a great staff. Uh, they do a good job. Um, at least it's still running, that's for sure. <laughs> You know, I, I, I've been called a lot of things in my career, but never an old dinosaur. Uh, oh, you were talking about uh, you were talking about something else. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. So. Morning, I'm Charlie Rennie. <clears throat> I sit on the Grand Traverse County Board of Commissioners. I'm here to ascertain the need and cost of a new jail, should we decide to go that way. It's going to be a very difficult sell to the community to pay for something that expensive. Thank you. 
I'm Mike Ailing with the Traverse City Police Department. I'm representing the City Police Department, who's clearly a stakeholder in our local jail. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Uh, Larry Inman, uh, Grand Traverse County Commissioner. This is my 22nd year in the County Commission, and I've been here through several renovations of the jail and community discussions about the jail. Um, I also um, am the chairman of the State Community Corrections Board in Lansing for the past 16 years. And we deal with uh, local communities and their jail population and mainly focus on jail um, and prison diversion programs uh, throughout the state. So I'm kind of wearing two hats today. Okay. So I'm hoping when we get through this process we can come to a clear, concise um, opinion as to the direction we want to go and then um, hopefully the follow-up meeting in Colorado will bring back the process that we need to go through. Okay, good. Thanks. Herb Lemkel, the chair of the Grand Traverse County Board of Commissioners. It's our responsibility to be fiscally responsible for the citizens of our community, but also to make sure that we have the right people that are going into jail and, uh, you know, looking at our mentally ill as to what we're, how we're handling it, are we handling it properly, and making sure that uh, the, the right programs are there for the right people. So I'm looking forward to see how this is going to, going to work out. Thank you. Sheree Shively, I'm the manager of Community Corrections, and he already explained the pretty much what we do. One of our um, factors that we focus on is having a positive impact on the jail utilization. So um, making it so that there's other programming available to those inmates so that it relieves some of the um, those that need to be housed. So. I'm Pam Blue, the Chief Probation Officer for the 86th District Court. I also um, am involved as a probation officer and coordinator of the sobriety court and mental health court. So. I'm very interested in how this is going to affect uh, the specialty courts as well. The two of you knew which chairs to grab when you came into the room. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Mike Stepka. I'm the chief uh, district court judge uh, in the 86th district. Um, and obviously, uh, when necessary, we sentence folks to jail. And we need to be sure that we have a safe, efficient jail with room um, uh, for uh, those folks that we do uh, have to uh, sentence to jail. So I'm concerned that um, the jail be a safe place both for the corrections officers and uh, for the inmates and uh, that it's not overcrowded. So okay. thank you. Good. Thank you. I was waiting to see if Todd was going to do it again, but he's good. So. So, so we've got good representation here today in terms of policymakers within the county and the criminal justice system. That's important for us to to, 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 to see that there is this cross-section because the reality is that any decisions that are made regarding capacity uh, has to involve the stakeholders of the criminal justice system. I want to spend a little bit of time and talk a little bit about the National Institute of Corrections uh, just so that there's an understanding of the role of that agency in providing services for you. Uh, NIC is a, is a part of uh, the Bureau of Prisons, which is underneath the Department of Justice uh, within the federal government. It's, it is an extremely small agency as size goes related to other federal agencies. Um, I don't know the exact count, but I would imagine that it's probably less than 100 employees. Um, and most of its divisions are housed in D.C. Uh, with two divisions in Aurora, Colorado. They have a national training center. Uh, in Aurora and a resource library that is in Aurora. And I see has the divisions of a community corrections division, a prisons division, a jails division, an executive administration division, then the academy and the resource center. Mark and I are here as uh, under contract with the jails division, uh, which that division is focused primarily on the 3,000 plus jails in the United States. I forget what the exact count is. Uh, but, but that division provides services directly to counties uh, that have jails and or correctional facilities. The other divisions handle, handle the other parts of it. Uh, NIC does a lot of programs and trainings. There's a website, has a lot of training that is provided, uh, not only just for jails, but for other, other uh, services within the criminal justice system. Um, and it also provides what is called technical assistance uh, specific to individual jurisdictions. 
And Mark and I are here as a TA event, a technical assistance event. Uh, the sheriff authored a letter to, that was sent to NIC requesting uh, this activity to occur. Uh, NIC reached back to the county, did a little bit of uh, groundwork in terms of what your needs are. Uh, identified and selected Mark and I to come provide this service for you. Uh, so it's a technical assistance event which is typically specific to the requesting county. Uh, we have to uh, provide a report as a part of our uh, responsibilities for this and typically that's coming out within two weeks to a month after we have been here. Uh, the report goes back to the requesting agency uh, in electronic format um, and it, it, it is the requesting agency's responsibility to disseminate that report uh, as appropriate and to handle any uh, information requests to gain access to the report. Uh, I don't think NIC does that um, as a FOIA request anymore, but they might. Um, anyway, the information center that is at NIC uh, is an online information center. It has a wealth of documents that, that are there. Uh, you can do title searches, you can be, do specific requests, you can ask to talk to a resource person out there uh, to answer your questions, but I would encourage you as, as you go forward with this process to continue to use NIC. We'll talk a little bit about the PONY program uh, later on in the presentation that you're coming to uh, in August on the 16th, I believe, 18th. Uh, when the program starts, I should know the date since I'm one of the instructors. I'll be there on the 16th, uh, I don't, I'll be looking for you all. Um, uh, but it, it, it is in August and there will be a group of four of you that will come out to that program. Okay, that's NIC's pitch uh, in terms of who they are, why they're here, um, and, and uh, who Mark and I are. So, a little bit about what we're doing here uh, these days. Um, NIC's been in business since 1981, roughly around that time. It, 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 it came out of a a conference that was held in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, which, and NIC was formed as a result of the Attica prison riots, if any of you remember those back in 69, I want to say is when they occurred, 69 or 70. Uh, and that prompted this national conversation about corrections and what's occurring uh, in corrections across the United States. So NIC was formed. Uh, and the jails division has a number of specific components that it provides. It has a whole block of services called facility development and planning. Uh, we are a piece of that block of uh, activity that NIC provides. The jail and justice system assessment has evolved over time. It used to be called Pony Phase 1. Uh, then it was called a local system assessment. Now it's called a jail and justice system assessment. Uh, it used to be uh, longer than this and it used to involve a lot more data collection and analysis. It was modified and changed over the last few years to be a little bit more specific to the jurisdictions. So really the role that Mark and I play during this visit is to come in and do a very quick overview of what's occurring in your county. Spend some time going through your facility, offering our observations and impressions of your, of your facility. Uh, to spend some time talking to key policymakers who we've interviewed over the course of time. Um, and then provide an opportunity today for us to get involved as, as local officials and talk a little bit about what we've seen and what we see as next steps for you. So that's where the, the, the JJSA is right now. It's got a number of goals. I'm not going to go through those right now. They're hard to see on the screen. They'll be in the presentation. All of our slides will be there. And we actually have, we should pass those handouts out. I forgot about that, Mark. Uh, the big packet of stuff, we have um, actual copies of the slides uh, before we made some changes to them last night. So it's just a little bit of way for you, for you to take some notes, track what we're doing, uh, and it talks about the goals. But the primary goal for today is, uh, or for this event, is to really see where you are, uh, see what opportunities there are for you to go forward, and just to give you a little bit of guidance as to what we see as next steps, just to help uh, facilitate the process. Okay. As I said, we spent uh, the better part of yesterday um, touring the facility, uh, as well as conducting a few more interviews. We spent Tuesday, a little bit of time with you in the morning, and then the bulk of Tuesday was more interviews, uh, and then this morning we conducted our last interview. Um, uh, and so we've gained some impressions, some observations, um, not necessarily conclusions, because conclusions would require a lot more data analysis and collection, 
But we've got some preliminary thoughts about uh, not only your building, uh, but about uh, use of alternatives and, 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 and what you're doing. So we're going to break this up. Mark's an architect. He's going to take the facility side of the conversation, walk you through uh, impressions and observations of your current building. Then I'm going to pick it up, um, and we're going to talk about uh, alternatives and what I'm seeing with some of the data that's coming out of your system. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll go through that presentation, if it's okay with you, and then we'll take our first formal break. Does that work? Uh, the scroll wheel does it. Do you want the handheld mic? Um, this is okay. Okay, good. No, this this one on the side. Okay. Uh, down is up. Oh, well, there it is. Down is up, okay. Yes, down, like down is forward. Okay, thank you, Jim. Your facility is, is relatively small, but it's one of the more complicated ones that um, I've been in in a long time, um, partially because it's, as you know better, better than me, it's evolved over time. The first part of it was built in 64. Um, the, the first renovation and, and addition was in 84 and 85, um, and that brought it up to 72 beds. It had, what, 50? Oh, no, 50-something um, beds to begin with, right? Yeah. Um, in 88, that's when the uh, work release trailers were added. That added another 26 beds. And then you, you, the sheriff and law enforcement moved out in around 2004, and that part was renovated, adding um, about 39 beds. Um, Currently, the rated capacity is 194, uh, although 26 of those beds are work release beds, and we're, we're going to go through uh, challenges, and, and, um, or they could be called challenges or problems or, or both. And one of the problems with the work release beds is that they're, they're in a bad place, and, um, and which makes them very staff inefficient, and, and they're, they're, as many of you know, they're currently closed, largely because they're so staff inefficient. Um, your square footage compared to other jails is, is, is actually on, on, on the low side, and that's partially because you have a relatively low number of, of single cells and two-person cells. You have mostly, um, um, six six person approximately uh, um, multi occupancy cells. You have one your one one large dormitory, and you you have less um, space in in services and in admin and in programs compared to the number of capac the capacity that you have than than many other jails. Um, you, you've done many good things to manage the population, and Jim will talk more more about th that later. But um, as as most of you know, you have a full array for a relatively for a not so large county. You have you have a large array of specialty courts, and and that's quite admirable. Um, and community corrections, and uh, both of those are having a, a major impact. And, and Jim will get into. The, the, the numbers, um, thanks for providing some of the data, uh, Charisse, that, that was helpful. You would definitely need a lot more beds if, if you didn't have the specialty courts and community corrections. And the other thing you do when you're overcrowded is lease beds from other counties. And you're fortunate that there are other counties that are, that are relatively close that have available beds. Um, we, we understand that that, that's, that situation isn't, isn't quite as convenient for, for those relatively few juveniles that need to be incarcerated. The distances are, are greater. And some of the people that we've met with this week have expressed a need for, to at least look at um, providing capacity for juveniles as well as adults here.
Call it back. Um, one, one disturbing thing to, to Jim and I um, is the number of places within your facility that we saw people sleeping on the floor or preparation to have extra people sleep on the floor. Um, including in, in the in, in the intake area. There's one room where we understand people are there for as much as 72 hours. Um, not, not only do you need more beds, and many, many people who look at jails um, who haven't worked in jails think just about adding beds when, when, when there's not enough beds. Um, but that's not, that, that's that's um, not a realistic way to, to look at it because the more inmates you have, the more medical services you have, the more meals you're, you're serving, um, the more paperwork is involved. So it, 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 the, the more people come through intake, the more people that are released, it, it impacts every, every function. And um, although you've done renov renovations and added more space over time, there's a number of areas that are that are too small, and that's negatively that can negatively impact operations. We're, we're not we're not criticizing operations. We think operations is 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 excellent in spite of all all these um, crowding and and space issues. We we Jim and I believe that you're doing the best job you can with a limited space. But as you can see from these two photos of medical and and uh, food services that there's not en not enough space. Um, visiting is 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 relatively small for the population, and we know it doubles for several other other purposes. Um, the, there's not enough interview areas. We we've heard that sometimes there's a there's people like 15 people waiting waiting in the small lobby um, to be able to to interview inmates. Um, there's too few opportunities, and most of your program space is, is in in the in the basement, um, which is which is poorly located. N new jails have program space either in or adjacent to the housing units, and that way those program spaces are, are used uh, a lot a lot more. If it's if it's difficult to or and it, or if it creates safety and security problems to move inmates um, a distance to program areas, they tend to be used a, a lot less. Um, the intake area is another one that has been expanded, but it still still has problems. You can see into a few of the holding cells, but, but um, not into all of them, or you can, but you have to move around a lot. Ideally, there should be from the booking station. You should be able to see into all the holding cells because it's it's a, it's a very stressful time for inmates. It, um, a lot of them are can be um, come in on drugs or alcohol. May have some health issues, mental health issues. Um, a lot of them are unknown. The numbers you can't really control the numbers coming in, so it's an area that can get quite crowded and uh, definitely needs more space and a different configuration than you have now. Um, the Sally Port was supposedly designed for two vehicles, um, but it's, it's, uh, one would have to be behind the other, and it really is too small for two. Plus, even if it was longer, one would block the other one. So newer Sally Ports have vehicles next to each other rather than behind each other. Um, the layout is really, really poor, and, and also because of the housing and it's being relatively small, it's staff inefficient. And uh, staff are not able to be in housing units or see inmates directly much of the time. 
there's two newer jails have larger housing units and um, are more likely to have staff in those housing units, which works a lot better. All the research supports that direct supervision works better than linear indirect supervision for staff and for inmates. Um, work, the biggest problem with work release is its location, that you have to move people or staff would have to go back and forth um, because work releases often work evenings or weekends. Um, some staff have to be in the building all the time and consequently it's, it's closed at the present time because it doesn't make sense to have a staff in, in a building with just three or four inmates during the day when most of the others are, are, um, are somewhere else. It's also, you know, a temporary building. Um, it wasn't intended as a, as a permanent building. Um, and in the long run, you, 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 need a, you need a better space for work release that's attached, that's part, part of the jail to be more efficient. Um, you're, in my opinion, you're, you're over-reliant on cameras. Um, you have lots of cameras and, it, and you need them. We understand why, why they were added but they don't work as well as people um, observing inmates. And you have lots, lots of blind spots throughout, and you know, um, it, it, again, you've, you put them in, in good places. We're not criticizing you doing the best you can, one, once again, by putting cameras throughout the facility. Uh, it's just unfortunate that you, that you need so many when direct observation by, by staff works better than, than than cameras. Especially with your control room staff also answering the phone and watching lots of cameras at the same time. Um, as good as, as they are and as well trained as they are, they may not see, um, see everything that they need to see. Um, a lot of people think just about the number of beds, but it's important to think about the types of beds, the types of environments that are that are needed. It's just not a, not a, not um, having enough beds, um, and that's of course one of the reasons too why we, justice consultants and the National Institute of Corrections, recommend that you have you have more beds um, than your average population, and that's in order to be able to house people by their classification category and also to be able to deal with peak populations, because again, you, you don't have that much control of how many people are in the jail, even with release mechanisms. Um, but a lot of your cells are not appropriate for especially special populations, um, like the mentally ill. They really, and, and we, we've heard that as many as 80% of your inmates are mentally ill. Many of them also have drug and alcohol problems. Um, they do a lot better in direct supervision um, environments with, with, with um, small, secure windows, with natural light, with views, with more color. Um, even though you have a great indoor-outdoor rec area, it's, it's, it's healthier for mentally ill and, and for other folks to have um, real outdoor secure areas to go to go to too. Um, yes, you know, it's not a holiday inn, um, but we need to treat people humanely or they or they can get worse in, in facilities like like this. Also your your female population is growing rapidly and um, many many females uh, do do better in direct supervision units too. And those, if there are 48 beds or so, that that could be um, just as staff efficient or even more staff efficient than, than what you have now. Um, another problem, and I'm glad that the maintenance manager is, or facility manager is here. You've, you've replaced um, toilets and um, 
HVAC systems and so forth, but still you have a lot of a lot of old parts and systems, um, and it's it's hard to to find replacement parts, or sometimes you 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 um, they're not available at all. Another major concern is all the cells that have have um, elements that are that are the opposite of suicide resistant. Um, it's good that you have all, all the cameras and that you've had relatively few suicides, but there's many, many opportunities um, in virtually all parts, all of the housing units for inmates if they, if they want to um, hang themselves to, to do that. The bar grade fronts are particularly um, problematic, but even, even the ladders that are in most of the, the cells can be problematic. Um, there are a lot of positive features about the facility. Um, number one is how it how how it's run. It's run extremely professionally. Um, it's very very clean. It certainly doesn't look even the parts you know that are that were built in '64 um, look like they're the, the the materials and finishes look like um, they're almost brand new. It's 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 very clean, very well maintained. Um, another thing that Jim and I notice when we walk through jails is how inmates behave, and and they, your inmates um, seem to re respect staff. They seem to be compliant. It reflects really positive on on the jail administrators and on jail staff. Um, one very unusual thing happened um, when Jim and I were walking through the other day. Um, an inmate actually complimented uh, maintenance staff for for taking care of something right away. We 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 rarely rarely hear, hear that. No. Um, the, the the another thing that's especially admirable about um, about the building is is the innovative uh, in, indoor outdoor recreation area. We Jim and I have been to hundreds of facilities, and I I don't know about you, but I haven't seen that before. It was really a good idea, and it seems to be working well. <coughs> The renovation that was that was done around 2004, 2005 was was really good, considering it was it's it's very challenging to renovate within um, basically what was offices before, what was where law enforcement was, the the dorm and the um, two level cell unit are are um, really follow a lot of really good design principles. So um, that's a that's a real positive about your your building also um, we understand that and from what we can see you you meet all of um, Michigan and American Correctional Association standards for design I'm going to turn it back to Jim to, to talk about alternatives different ways that you're keeping your population down thanks Mark so Mark's taking you through kind of a, a quick armchair tour of your facility. A lot of you live it every day, have seen it every day, or have seen it uh, before. Um, the summary is you've really made good use of that building over time. We don't know yet if it's time to move away out of, out of that building. and We certainly don't have any idea of what the cost implications are. Uh, but we also know that this community views the jail as a piece of the sanctioning process within the criminal justice system, not as the only sanction. That's a tremendous positive statement. You've done work on this project before through your earlier studies and your earlier evaluations, and you've taken time to begin to capture some of the other ways of managing behavior, <clears throat> of managing behavior while still maintaining public risk. And so the question as you go forward is, have we done everything? 
But we don't, we don't know if you've done everything, but let's try and summarize some of the things that you've done and then do a quick snapshot of where maybe you've been having some impact on the jail population. Through our interviews, uh, we heard repeatedly that you have a number of specialty courts in place. We didn't collect data or analyze data about the impact of those courts, but we heard repeatedly that you have a number of specialty courts that is returning individuals to the community better than when they first came to the jail and helping maintain public risk. There's a cost associated with those courts in terms of staff and resources, but we heard of three courts and we also heard, and, and I'm going to ask the question, I don't know if Veterans Court is in place or is being considered. It's in place, but we have a very small number. Okay. So, so, so it's there, maybe not as, effect, as effective as it could be yet. Okay. So, so may, maybe distributed into the other courts. But you've got four specialty courts right now. A sobriety court, a mental health court, domestic violence court, and a veterans court, as we heard through our interviews very positive that you have those specialty courts in place. I don't know of other jurisdictions typically that we work with that have that many. Oftentimes we'll see a, a, a drug court or a sobriety court and none of the other courts or a mental health court and not the other. So you've got four. That's a real positive. You also have community corrections and other forms of, say, of, of alternative program, probation, uh, but we focused on community corrections uh, as to try and get a sense of what impact is that having in your community. And so we asked for a snapshot of information, real information based on yesterday at 7.30 a.m. or whatever the time was. It was early in the morning. We asked for a snapshot of information of just what's occurring in community corrections. This is what came back to us, that you had 13 in residential treatment, 10 in a transitional housing uh, uh, activity, 16 on telephone tether with house arrest, another three on GPS tether, uh, two on GPS tether for felony inmates, uh, and 46 on community service. That was yesterday's snapshot. We then took it a step further, and we'll see that later on, in terms of what impact did those types of programs have last year, 2013. So we had that information about your jurisdiction. Then we collected some others. We did another snapshot on May 7th, I believe it was. Captain Hall provided this information. Just to kind of get a sense of what's occurring in Grand Traverse County. On that day, you had 131 males, 37 females. So that's 168 in custody, if I do the math right. 168 that day, rated uh, number of beds available, rated, is that rated capacity, 94, 194? We're going to talk a little bit about rated operational capacity, rated capacity of 194. So the math on that day says we had 26 beds available. That number includes work release. Conversation Mark just had about the utilization of that space. You all, all know the utilization of that space and the difficulty. So that 26 is misleading in terms of how the building is being operated and the beds that are available. On that day, you had 17 folks in another jurisdiction. You weren't housing anybody here for another jurisdiction. Just a snapshot in time to demonstrate what's occurring just in terms of beds that are available on that day. We had the community correction snapshot. We got the jail snapshot. So I spent some time last night, put together a couple of charts that help to try and demonstrate a broader picture of what's been occurring. So we did, we did a 10 year window. And you'll see 2013 A and B down there. One number includes work release, one number doesn't. So I took the liberty to pull work release out of there and says, what does that mean if those beds aren't there? If that affects our, our rated capacity. So if you look down the left-hand column, it's the year, uh, the rated capacity, you'll see 194 all the way down till 2013B when it goes to 168. Did I do the math right? Then you'll see the average daily population provided from within the criminal justice system through Captain Hall. 
I grabbed that number, plugged it in, and then I took the liberty to say, okay, what does that mean in terms of oper operating the building? What is our number over our rated capacity? Are we crowded? And what is our percentage over the rated capacity? Just a couple ways to look at what's occurring over that 10-year period. If you look at that chart only, <clears throat> and you only look at beds and average daily population, and I'm an average citizen out there, I'm going to say, so what's the problem? You're, what's going on? It's negative numbers. You've got, you're not in a poor situation. Goes back to Mark's comments about the right type of bed, the, how that bed is utilized, what it means operationally. It also says to me, gee, we gotta, we gotta do a little bit more than just a one chart like this to be able to understand more about what's occurring in our system. Maybe it's a nice visual, but gee, it really doesn't answer a lot of questions. So I took it a step further. Took a little liberty with your numbers, and I said, okay. I started my career as a correctional officer. I know working in the institution that if every bed is full, it makes my life hard. I can't move people around. Jim Robertson comes to jail, and he's one of those folks that's a repeat offender. He has a substance abuse issue. He comes in, and for the first four or five days, he's really hard to manage. He dries out, cleans himself up, and on day seven or eight, he's one of the best inmate workers you've ever had. You probably don't have anybody like, anybody like that in your system. But when I come in on those first four or five days, I've got special needs. And there has to be a place for me to go to manage my safety, the safety of staff, and the safety of community. If every bed is full, and the bed that I need to occupy is occupied by somebody else who has a greater need than mine, then I don't get that bed. But if their need is lesser and they've been there for three days and they're starting to calm down, I've got to move them to some place in order to have a bed for me, and it becomes a real management nightmare. So we have this term called operating capacity, classification factor. You'll hear a number of terms about it. What it basically says is, there has to be a percentage of empty beds on any given day in order to move folks around properly to maintain the safety and the management of their behavior inside the institution. I used 15%. You'll hear numbers anywhere from 20% to 10%. I used 15%. That says on every, any given day you should be at 85% of capacity in order to effectively operate that building. So I added a new column called operating capacity. You'll see at the bottom, operating capacity is 85% of rated capacity. It's an Excel spreadsheet, simple formula in there. And so what it says is, instead of 194 beds, I really only have 164.9, 165. I should have rounded it up. So my true operating capacity of that 194 is only 165. If I then take the same figures, ADP, and look at percentage over operating capacity, and numbers over operating capacity, the chart gets a little different. You'll see a trend in 2013 where the number is shrinking in terms of what we are over operating capacity. And if you take work release out of the mix, what happens in 2013? You're now in a crowded situation. You were, you were getting closer to crowding, but if you take work release out of the equation, and I know that that's a, 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 going to be a, a lively discussion at some point, taking those beds offline, but that's what happens from an operating capacity standpoint. So a little bit more detail of looking at things, a little bit different way of looking at the numbers, but as you go forward with this process, you've got to put a lot more into that. So just a way of painting the picture of what's occurring in Grand Traverse County. Yes? Just real quick. Uh that's an annual figure in that yes. it fluctuates from day to day, and some days it goes way up, some days it goes down. And, uh, fantastic, fa fantastic point. Thanks for bringing it up. Been doing this for a while, so sometimes it, 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 it takes somebody to, to pull me back. Interesting concept when we use the word average. It's really um, a disservice to only look at average, because an average means that 50% of the time you're above that number, 
and 50% of the time you're below. So it doesn't give you a, a true picture of what's occurring on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Absolutely. This community is doing a very good job of managing this dynamic. Because you've made a policy decision that you're going to have conversations among others and you're going to do things differently. But at some point, everything that you've done is going to have its, have its impact and you're going to have to consider other options. And so my point with this is that there's a lot that goes behind those numbers. There's policy decisions that are affecting those numbers, and there's services and activities that affect those numbers. And we'll talk more about creating those numbers in that dynamic when we talk about needs assessment. I want to focus on community corrections for a moment. We asked for some data, uh, and we pulled that data um, um, from Sharice. Okay. I'm horrible with names, so bear with me. Um, she provided that stuff again yesterday morning, and we looked at 2013. We took some liberty with the information, tried to do a quick analysis of it and what it means, but at the end of the day, we looked at 2013, and we did a calculation at the bottom of what is the potential average daily population reduction to the jail with community corrections. We know there may be a little bit of a, of a, of a flaw in some of our calculations because we did it quickly, but we said if we look at those number of bed days that are being saved because of these programs, the assumption is everybody that's in community corrections would have been in jail. We know that that may not be 100% of the case, but we did it for this analysis to show impact that we're saving on average about 48 beds a day. Folks that should have, would, would have been in custody if there hadn't been community corrections. So there's a cost associated with doing community corrections. There's staffing, there's office spaces, there's resources, GPS technology, etc. There's costs with incarceration. You're choosing to have a balance of those. So what happens if community corrections isn't available? What does it mean to your community? So I got playing with Excel last night and putting charts together and having some fun, and so I began to look at this and said, okay, let's take community corrections out of the equation, and let's take it all the way back to 2003. We know that the 48 beds wasn't going to be the same in 03 that it was in 2013, but for the sake of demonstrating the impact of community corrections, I kept it the same each year, just to show what it would have been. If you take community corrections away, then you have been crowded every year since 2003 in viewing the operating capacity. That's a tremendously positive statement for your community to say, we, we're doing something other than jail. Mark it, I don't know if you're doing everything. There's always going to be that conversation. But just look at the impact of community correction. And so at some point during this evaluation in this study, you need to ask yourselves, oh, what was that quote? You need to ask yourselves, are you having, what's that Clint Eastwood quote? Now I can't remember. Dirty Harry, whatever it was. Anyway, you have to ask yourselves, are we doing everything we can with community corrections or with other things? But here's the impact of that. I didn't look at budgets 100%, but I bet it's less expensive to run community corrections than it is the jail. I guarantee you it is. I didn't look at the budgets to have to confirm that. I just know it from experience. So there's the impact. Tremendous. This will be in our, in our report. So it just demonstrates that you have opportunities, you have a way to affect the system other than community corrections. And at some point you say, okay, we've done all that we can, and now it's time to address other parts of the criminal justice system. And it may be the physical plan of the jail. Okay, just a quick uh, visual uh, to demonstrate those, or to kind of summarize those charts that I did before. There's only two things that control capacity in the jail. Just two things, very simple variables. How many folks come in? How many folks go out? So we use a water barrel analogy. If you can control the top spigot, the inflow, 
you can have an impact on the water that's inside the tank. If you can control the outflow, you can have a control on that tank. If you squeeze them both tight, that tank's going to fill up and bust. If you open them all up, the tank's going to be empty. We know that neither one of those scenarios is probably going to happen in Grand Traverse County, but we do know that through policy and practice, you have the ability to influence the inflow and you have the ability to influence the outflow. And that impact is on average length of stay, how long they stay inside the water barrel and the level of that water. Back to the point earlier that we know that water level rises weekly, daily, it goes up and down based on influences. But that's really the simple way of looking at things in terms of what, what influences you can have within your community. Okay. Great. Been at it for an hour. Let's take um, five or ten minutes. Take five minutes. Phone calls, break, etc. We'll come back. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of lectures, hopefully interactive enough uh, that we don't fall asleep, but we're going to go through a couple of lectures, come back, um, we'll probably do, do another break between here and lunchtime. Coffee, snacks, water, restrooms, done.
Mark and I want to spend some time now and go through two um, lectures, pieces of information uh, that are hopefully going to provide you a sense of direction as you go forward. Uh, we're convinced that the county is committed to taking the proper steps to help define your future. We've heard that through every policymaker that we chatted with. We've seen it in some of the reports and the documentation that you've presented. So you're not afraid of the planning process. You actually embrace it, understand its importance and its value. So let's spend some time and discuss what we see as the steps that you're going to need to go through moving from today, which is, gee, we think we need to do something, all the way through defining the problem and implementing a solution. I don't know what's doing, as if it's me or... Okay. Not used to the mics. So, let's talk about the facility development process. NIC has authored a number of publications, put together uh, a flow chart, which will be part of the report, uh, that demonstrates uh, the steps or the phases that typically a community goes through when planning for new facilities. It's called the facility development process, but it's not just about building. It's about policy and process. And we'll talk about that as we go through, through the presentation. Captain Hall's received a number of publications. When the group comes out to Colorado, there'll be more publications uh, that you'll have access to, as well as ones that are throughout from the Information Center. But when you come to Colorado, you're going to focus on phases one through four of this process in a lot more detail than we're going to go through today. Mark and I want to take you through what these phases are. Typically, there's nine phases. And it goes from where we are today, like, gee, we think we need to do something, all the way through what's called post-occupancy. We've now opened up the building, and we're evaluating, or opened up the process. We've done something, and we're now evaluating the effectiveness of, of that uh, solution. There's a phase called project recognition, another phase called needs assessment, master planning. There's another phase called facility program development and then a phase called project definition and implementation. Those four phases occur typically before you ever start the design process. You may have some concepts that are developed, but you haven't formally hired the architect and started the design process. Then you go through a series of design phases, a series of bidding and negotiation phases, a construction phase or implementation phase if it's alternative services. You occupy and then you do the post-occupancy evaluation. That's typically the nine phases you go through. There's a lot that goes into each one of those phases. We're going to talk about them in a little bit of detail as we go forward. There's a flow chart that we've put together. There's a couple of publications that are companions to that that just help you understand more detail this process. If we look at, at that first phase, project recognition, there's a part of it that is defining the problem. We've seen symptoms of the problem right now in terms of crowding, bed capacity, but I'm not so sure that the county, I don't think that I do, fully understand what is the problem. Is a lack of beds a symptom or is it something else that's occurring? And so the county has to spend some time and really get into defining that problem. What also occurs in that first phase, that project recognition phase, is that you begin to look at your current buildings. You assess your resources your and your liability. That was part of what Mark and I did yesterday. We think your building has limitations. It's, it's phenomenal that, that you have continued to use that building since 1964 in the capacity as a correctional facility by modifying it, making adjustments. I mean, it was, number one, to see Terrazzo floor was, was phenomenal. But, 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 but the cleanliness of that building, the ability of it to still be, be maintained in that fashion, 
um, was phenomenal. I, I had a boss that said once that a clean jail is not necessarily a, a well-run jail, but every well-run jail is clean. And that's true. So there's pride in that facility, not only from the correctional staff, but from the county as a whole to maintain that building. But at some point, everything reaches the end of its useful life. Partly because of the infrastructure that is there. We know that the security system is different than it was in 1964. However, some of the big paracentric keys are probably the same as they were in 1964. Some of the locks in the old cell block areas with the cranks are probably the same. And I don't know if we asked the question, but I bet getting replacement parts is tough if they have them. They don't exist. They only exist, so you have to fabricate something. So there's a cost associated with that. So part of this early process is to just take a pretty in-depth look at what's, what's, what is the true useful life of that building? And do we need to begin to make some adjustments? You also begin to look in this first phase about the justice agencies working together. We're convinced that there is a commitment from the policymakers within this county, as well as other outside agencies, to work together. We didn't hear anybody say that they weren't willing to work together. That doesn't mean that you all agree with each other. It doesn't mean that at all. But there's a willingness to come to the table and to tackle this issue. That's a real positive. We've been in other communities where it's not necessarily the case. But here, we didn't see any of it. Now, we recognize that we're a couple guys from the outside coming in. Um, there's a degree of typically politeness that we are afforded. Uh, but we gave everybody an opportunity to address that issue. We didn't hear anything negative that concerns us. So that's good. So now the question is, how do we go forward? What do we do next? Well. We heard a commitment to follow the steps of the process and to understand what's ahead of us so that we make good, sound, data-driven decisions. We heard that over and over again in our conversation. So you're at that project recognition phase. So what's next? There's a phase called needs assessment master planning. We're going to go through this presentation and then spend some more time in detail on this one particularly. But this is really the phase where you collect and analyze information. And you, be, you, you project what the future is going to hold for the county in capacity, in programs and services, in cost associated with each one of those. It's really where you put together a, a true roadmap for the future. You do it in the needs assessment phase. You've done some of this work previously. Some of you may be involved in, the, in, in those projects. So this is not a foreign concept to you, but it's one that you got to tackle as you go forward. It helps you begin to <coughs> arrive at the best solution for your community. So we have the needs assessment phase in the second phase. We're going to go into it in more detail in a bit. Then we have this activity called pre-architectural program. What the heck does that mean? The operation of a correctional facility must drive its design. The operation of this building must drive its design, just like the courthouse, just like your home. How it's going to function has to be directly related to the spaces that are identified and the operation of those spaces. As you begin to validate and consider the limitations of your current building and or opportunities to improve those through other programs and services, you have to spend some time and go through a detailed analysis of how things are going to operate. Not how they operate today, because space is driving some of your operations today. Because that's all you have. Programs are in the basement because that's the only space you have for programs. Is it the best space for programs to be? I don't think so. Just from a circulation standpoint, going down steps, going down elevators, sight line and observations, the ability to respond to emergencies, it creates a series of difficulties and limitations. The good news is you're providing programs and services inside the building. The bad news is you got to do it in the basement right now. That would not be your preference. And so going through this process allows you to define your operational requirements into the future and then figure out 
Is it renovating the existing building? Is it building new? What, you know, what are going to be our operational requirements? And then, what are the associated spaces that are needed for those operations? How big should the booking area be? How big is a typical housing unit? How big should programs and services be, and where should it be located? All of that happens during this phase, which is typically a companion document to the needs assessment. So these two documents together help us provide information to the design team as they start, start the process of figuring out the best way to lay out a building, if that's your approach. What happens in these first three phases is that we develop at the end of that typically a document that is defining our project. If it's increase in capacity, how many beds is it going to be? If it's a regional facility, where is that facility located? What type of inmates go to that facility? What is the opportunity to contract with other counties? What does this then mean for Grand Traverse County and what happens to our building? Is our building an intake and release center? Is it a community correction center? Is it something different? Or gee, we think the best solution for Grand Traverse County is to be X number of beds at a different location at X dollars of cost. All of that happens during these early phases, during the planning phases. You truly define your project. How big, where is it located, and what is the cost to operate those solutions, typically from a staffing perspective. You use the same baseline, the same variables of evaluation in each one of those potential recommendations, and that's what comes out of these first four phases. The county now has the roadmap for the future. So that, that project recognition phase is that bridge between planning, identifying needs, and design. Mark's going to take it over now and talk about the design process uh, and the rest of the phase of the facility development process and pull together the linkage between those two. Ideally, the design process overlaps with the planning process um, because there's still a lot of big decisions. Most of the major decisions are, are made, um, as Jim, Jim described, during during the needs assessment process and the operational and architectural programming. But there may still be some major decisions to be made and actually the farther along in the project that you go, the, the less control a county has in, 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 a, in a jail project or any major project. The most impact you, you have is early on. Um, have, were any of you involved in the 1964 building? Yes? Not in design. No, okay. Okay. But you you were in the 84 any yes. and anybody else in the 84? And and how about in the well the next one was what 88? 88 was when we added the Yeah, years. right. And then probably more of you were involved in 2004, 2005. Okay. Sonny shaking his head. Yeah. So y y y um, hopefully the planners and architects well, I used to work for, for the last architect that used Rosser. Um, I know that their process is to heavily involve client representatives, and I'm sure they, they involved you. Um, I urge you through, through the planning and, and design to, to get yourselves or people that, that um, can represent your, your views and your type of input in, 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 in the process, and it's really important to have have lots of different perspectives. Um, security, a uh, number of, of people have brought up, you know, of course, um, everybody's brought up, brought up safety and, and law enforcement staff and, and jail staff should, should be involved in that, but um, be good for your controller hat to, to, to be involved or other people that are watching, um, watching the dollars and even more importantly than watching the construction dollars is looking, um, looking at the staffing implications of, of major decisions or, that are made, as, as Jim and I have said, that that's, that, and as those of you um, that, are, that have been involved before know, that's, that's the biggest cost over the long term. 
um, generally about 80% of life cycle costs go, go to staffing alone, so to look at staffing implications. And it's good that um, the facility manager is here and hopefully you're, you're continued to be involved no matter what, what direction the county goes, if renovation additions, um, new construction. That's good to get that kind of input on um, finishes, materials, equipment, building systems. And again, it, we, we urge you to, th to think um, long term, not just initial costs, because too many counties that, that we've done work for in the past, they go with, they value engineer projects and put in inexpensive HVAC systems, for instance, to begin with, and then are replacing them all the time. Um, so you, 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 many of you know that already. Your, your involvement is, is, is really important um, all the way through, but especially in, in the planning and early design phases. Um, when you did the 2004 um, renovation, I imagine that, that Rosser came up with several different conceptual designs and, and and uh, that's, that's the way to go, that the, the early part of um, the first part of design is, is schematic and the earlier part of that is conceptual design. What architects uh, usually do and we recommend is, um, is to come up with three or four different, different conceptual design options and then compare them. Um, look at the pros and cons of each one including, not, not, again, not just um, a, a rough idea, that's all you could get at that time, of, of construction costs, you know, usually based on per square foot, but also looking at the staffing implications of, of, of each of the conceptual design options. And um, from what we've heard in the last two days, and there, there may be many more different types of conceptual design options, but they, they could be as, as diverse as as uh, going with another county and adding to one of to their existing facility and building making it a regional jail instead of building your own facility that so you could explore that as one conceptual design if, if you haven't already resolved it during the planning phase um, another might be tearing down part of your jail and build and um, renovating another part or renovating all of it or or and, and another one that that there's seems to be a lot of interest um, is is to build on a build a new facility and a new site, and then there's various sub options of of, of all of these. Um, for instance, with the new site option, um, whether it includes the sheriff's law enforcement um, division too, and possibly uh, city police, and you know, that, those drive different sites. So all of this, all these early phases, really need to overlap with um, with site site selection because that that of course will have a major impact on your conceptual design um, if you have you know 10 or 15 or more acres you, you could obviously build a, a, a lower facility if, if if a decision's made to stay in or near your current location then that might you know need to be three or four or maybe even more more levels again depending upon what 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 goes in it how many beds? Um, what other what other uh, elements go in it, like uh, sheriff's offices? Uh, any questions on on um, those different types of options? As part of the concept of a regional jail is very attractive to a lot of people. Um, could you talk first? I, we don't have any regional jails, to my knowledge, in Michigan. Uh, and I know some of the reason is you need proximity to the courthouse right. in order to move the inmates back and forth yes. and uh, facilitate their participation in the criminal justice process. Um, but sentenced individuals can be warehoused off site, uh, usually at a great distance. Could you give us some idea of how that might be done in other counties? Okay. There's, again, there's several sub options to every options. Option you could have a um, you could have a re a regional jail that that just had sentenced inmates or sentenced inmates from your county. If it was out if it was out of county, if it's 
if it, if the regional jail was here, then you could then it would, in my opinion, make sense to have all of your inmates in it because it's more cost efficient operationally usually to have have one facility for, operated by a county than mul multiple ones. Um, but if um, if if you're going to join with another county out, out, outside of Grand Traverse County, um, then one sub option would just be to have sentenced inmates there. Another, if it's a, if it's a, if the distance is relatively short, and we heard that there's one county that has a jail that's only about 20 minutes from here, you know that might that might be feasible because it's not that far to have all your inmates there. So a, a, again. Um, we suggest to, to, to really study e each one and what the economic impact would be and, and also to see um, how, how feasible e each, each option is as far as, as, far as getting support. Um, you, you could, for instance, keep, keep your um, existing facility um, primarily as an intake facility and, and release facility or a step further would be all pretrial inmates. A step further would be some s lower security um, sentenced inmates. Um, one option would be just to have all females go to the, the regional facility. But then if they were pretrial females, that would be a bit of a problem. Although if it's only 20 minutes away, um, another thing to look at is the feasibility of having, having a, um, a secure court courtroom um, with with the regional facility or even if even with your the other option of you having your own facility and an outlying s site you might want to consider um, a court secure courtroom one thing that surprised uh, Jim and Jim and me and we have some concern about it is that right now you have that inmates are walked from the jail to the courts and that really is is you know uh, I'm, I'm sure you know not not um, not good for anybody, for staff, or for the, or, or, potentially for for the inmates. So, um, with all the different options that you're exploring, I, we suggest that that you look at improving um, court security or bringing inmates to court. And there's lots of different ways to, to do that. But as as being part of the the big picture and 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 um, a problem to solve. Um, I've worked on a number or several regional jail studies, um, and th the reality is, it's it, it politically it can be really challenging to have a regional jail because, at least from my experience, everybody wants to control it, um, and so you need to, that that needs to be resolved really really early on before you <coughs> go very far. And some some uh, counties have have like a, a board with representatives from from each of the county and they're they're the ones that um, that that oversee the facility um, another option is for the other county to to really run it and you really are just leasing beds but maybe you have a fixed number of beds that you pay for all the time um, so you're guaranteed those beds um, there are some states west I, Worked on a regional jail in West Virginia, and, and I believe Virginia also has regional jails where the state encourages counties um, to have regional jails, and this works as, makes a special sense with with smaller counties. Um, so, um, no, in West Virginia, they're 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 pretrial too. They're pretrial in sentence. And then the same with Virginia, you'll, you'll have three or four counties. And Cases it is just a, just a sentence facility for everybody except for the host county. In other cases, the counties are sending everybody there. So, um, we we know that that leasing beds from other counties currently is attractive to some to some um, people here in Grand Traverse County, but is. And it's probably clear to you all already that there's there's several downsides to that. You know, one is what happens when their numbers go up. Two is what happens when they decide to greatly increase their per diem um, 
per diem fees. It's you know, you, so we we encourage you to whatever with all these options to to be able to have some 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 major voice and control, um, and that 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 can be challenging. It can has killed a lot of regional jail um, um, projects. Um, um, one that you might want to look at if you if you're looking at facilities, um, Bob um, Rosser did a regional jail in Northwest Ohio, so that that isn't terribly far, um, and that is working well. That's the one that includes the city of Toledo. Yeah. Yes. yes. What's the rationale of having the sheriff department in a jail? Um, there's certain functions that. Well, several things. You you can save some space for um, you know have like one records room, one uh, locker room, one training room, um, one lobby. It could save a few positions, um, but more importantly, everybody works together better if they see each other face face to face. If if they you know, see each other in 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 um, when they're having lunch or when they're in the locker room, and then a department can can work better if they if they're in the same building. So there's some space efficiencies, could be some staffing efficiencies, but I think most importantly, um, people tend to work better if they see each other. If there's any conflict, if you if you see somebody face to face, it's easier to resolve it. And, and oftentimes, there's a consideration for emergency response uh, as a supplement. Uh, to the correctional staff, if there's emergency response, and oftentimes uh, vehicle maintenance is, is considered for hope. Uh, oftentimes there's a, a uh, consideration for emergency response uh, for uh, supplementing the correctional staff uh, if the facility is co-located and also there's a consideration for vehicle maintenance uh, and having some of those support functions as Mark indicated uh, co-located so there, there's some efficiency and economy of scale from that. Well, we have a great relationship with our city county. Yep. So right. if you put a jail outside the county then, it, then you lose that city county relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, and one thing, another option. Again, you know, there's, we, we I think already we've come up with about a dozen. But um, one one option would be to look for other sites that that are within the city where you could continue if you if everybody agreed that that was a good thing to do to have both the jail, um, city law enforcement, and and sheriff's law enforcement. There, there probably are some places where that all all can work. Um, often consultants to, uh, work with you f first and develop site, site criteria because you, you would need to know, you know, are you looking for, somebody mentioned 40 acres, you know, do you really need 40 acres or would, you know, 15 acres, but that, but all, all these things so overlap with each other. There's many urban jails that you know are on less than five acres because they wanted to be next to the courts, and that's that's all that that uh, was available. So it it also it depends upon your philosophy. There's some jurisdictions that are opposed to uh, you know a multi-level um, jail, and 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 others prefer it, and and both can work really well. Um, the, the, the only concern is that if it's a really tiny site, then um, then it doesn't then it's less staff efficient. If you don't get enough beds per per floor, then it becomes sort of like um, year 2004, 2005. It, you know, they're they're decent designs, but it could have been even more staff efficient if there were more more housing units in in that area that um, staff staff can manage. Right. And that we were remodeling the system building system. Yeah. There's some structural issues because at one point there was two, two housing pods in there instead of one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Though it's much more challenging to 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 um to do something within an existing building that was used for for another purpose and often they don't work very well. So you again you, you they did, you did collectively a real admirable job with those, with those units. Um, so so af after you, after 
at the earlier part of conceptual design, uh, developing several conceptual design options and s analyzing them and selecting one that, that, um, that, that is best and getting a lot of input, you know, does it, does, is it functional, is it safe, is it cost efficient to staff, a um, whole, whole lot of other, other criteria. Uh, does, it, does it suit your population? You know, will it support um, the different populations that will be in, in, incorporated or housed in it? Then, then you, you pick one of those options and develop then the schematic um, design, which is basically um, a floor plan and, um, and, and elevation and, and, and a section. And it, um, again, it's very, very important for, to have a lot of involvement in that to make sure it works. It's largely based on what Jim was talking about, the operational and architectural program, which will indicate all the spaces um, that are needed, the sizes of them, the adjacencies, and, um, and at, at the same time, a, 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 a staffing plan needs, should, should be, or initial staffing plan. It might be hard to do a, um, to, to, to look at the layout and see, oh, you know, this is where I would put a staff, or this staff can do this, per, this function and that function from, from this area. Um, the, one, one lesson learned that, that I've seen too many times, though, is sometimes um, people look at plans and think that staff can, can handle more than they really can. You know, I've been in too many housing units where the team had thought that the staff could look behind them and look ahead of them, you know, and on both sides at the same time. And of course, that's that's not feasible. So it needs to be realistic. And uh, at the same time, um, should consider what their job descriptions would be and and uh, shifts and so forth. So the the schematic design um, will usually is tweak numerous times to make sure that all the adjacencies work and that the spaces are, are right. And also should even start thinking about um, the ambiance, you know. Um, in, there's a lot of research that supports um, the value of natu natural light, for instance. So, you know, looking at what areas get natural light, you know, if, the, if the footprint is, is is, is too fat that can limit natural light, those sorts of things uh, can, should be looked at starting with the schematic design. Um, what kind of image um, do you want the building to, to, to convey to the community? You know, some obvious ones, safety and security. Uh, several people have said to us in the last two days, you know, we don't want a holiday in, so, um, at, at the same, and part of it that will depend upon um, on location. If it, generally, um, if a facility is downtown or in an area yeah, adjacent to downtown, then it, then uh, usually there is a desire for it to, to to not look like the other buildings, but to blend in with the with with the other buildings that are that are in that area. Um, if it's more rural, then it may not matter as much ha ha how it looks. Although, again, we encourage you to not, um, are you all familiar with the term value engineering? It, it basically means looking at a design and trying to figure out how to make it cheaper. And, and you know, every building should go through that process. We've just seen too many buildings that have been overvalued engineered and, and, and are too cheap and don't, don't um, hold up and it can cost the community more in, in the long run. Um, but the, the other thing is if you, you want to continue to, to attract and keep, keep good staff and, and a more pleasant environment um, can definitely help, help do that. If, if they have a decent, um, we, you know, we were in the, what was the original break room in the jail and it was, you know, more the size of a toilet. Um, you know, it's, instead, having 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 a nice break room with with um, with a window. A lot of jails now have patios, so it gets some fresh air. That and it, it's it's not um, it 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 helps 
it helps the, the staff's physical health and mental health just like it, it helps um, the inmates too. So um, those, those kinds of things can make, make a, a big, big difference. Having a decent uh, training room, um, good acoustics, all those things can help you keep uh, and attract good staff. There's studies that show that with direct supervision, staff um, are have take fewer sick days and staff turnover is lower. You know, and staff turnover can, as you know, can be hugely expensive. So, I know sometimes people, some people complain about too many amenities for for staff, but a lot of those are required, and and others will help you keep and and um, keep and attract good staff. Um, so after, after you finish the schematic design process and um, everybody's satisfied with, with, with the layout, with the floor plan, with, with um, the elevation, um, then you move on to design development and it's really, you, you know, we talk about three distinct phases, schematics, design development and construction documents, but but they sort of bleed into each other. I mean, the basic idea is you just keep on adding more, more detail um, to the drawings. And with the design development, though, is, is a big step in that it's not just that architects do the drawings, it's uh, civil engineers, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electric, electric, uh, electrical engineers, um, electronics, security electronics, you, you start thinking about all the building systems that go go in and start indicating where, where they go and what what they are and start making um, a lot of decisions on building systems and types of glazing in different in in different places and you know where do you have porcelain toilets and where do you have stainless steel toilets and and um, what what kind of locks on doors so it, it's a it's a much bigger bigger team effort. Um, it's a lot of refinement and again a lot of your input uh, is, is, is needed. Construction documents is, is basically continuing to, 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 to detail even further but um, and from its name it's probably obvious it, it, it shows the, the contractors exactly how things come together. It's very very detailed. And that whole process um, usually takes up to up to a year, sometimes sometimes more. Um, during dur during construction, have you had? Does the county usually use construction managers or program managers for projects? Yeah, they they usually. Can help quite a lot, but it's also important to have um, a transition team and and for people on the transition team to keep an eye on 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 construction, really on a on a some people on a daily basis, make sure they're doing things right. Um, <coughs> Um, and of course, manage manage different contracts. Take care of um, pay requests. Make sure that they're not asking for for um, a higher percentage than they've completed. And that that often um, takes a year to to two years to to build, depending upon whether it involves renovation. Um, if you do renovation and expansion of your current facility, that could add more time. Um, one of the big challenges, of course, is keep, you'd have to keep the facility open while, um, while you're renovating and expanding it, and make sure that contraband it was a huge problem in renovation projects. You know, make sure have ways that nails and other other items that could become weapons don't get in the building. But also, like for instance, if you were building or expanding the kitchen, to make sure you have a way to continue to provide food service throughout the, the whole process, um, it can be much much more 
complicated and challenging to manage. Um, th throughout design and construction, it's and we, we've hit on some parts of it. There really needs to be um, a transition team and a and um, a transition process. Um, you need, for instance, to have people that are looking at different types of um, furniture and equipment and ordering them on time to be installed. Uh, you usually would be fine-tuning or revising uh, job descriptions. Um, for instance, if you go to direct supervision or partially direct supervision and you haven't had that before, then, then you would tweak um, job descriptions. And it's also, you would, if, if it means more staff, and almost all the time it does, um, start recruiting staff and training staff and having them work in the existing facility before the new facility or expanded facility is built. Um, other, other things that the program manager, construction manager can help with are, um, are warranties and, and uh, punch lists where you all should be involved or a team, the transition team should be involved in punch lists, basically walking through making lists of, of what the contractor needs to complete. I'll get this right eventually. Um, so yeah, this is this is phase eight occupancy and operation, but again, it really really starts um, much sooner in order to make sure you get the the um, the furnishings that have the staff in place and so forth before before you move in. Um, some facilities have like open houses before the, before they open up. Um, I've never done it myself, but um, some some staff actually spend the night to, to get a sense of it bef before, and that's a good way to, to, to test everything, make sure everything works real well before you bring any, any inmates in. Breaks. Yeah. How any? about we take a uh, five minute break, we'll come back and we'll go through needs assessment before lunch. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it did say that.
from an agenda perspective, uh, we're losing the crowd. From an agenda perspective, uh, Mark and I have done some, some calculation and we think uh, that we'll get through most of the stuff before lunch. Um, and then we'll break for lunch, have some private lunch, and then come back and do a short thing this afternoon. Um, and we're probably looking at no later than 2 p.m. that we'll call it today. So I, I think that, that'll work for everybody's schedule. So let, let's spend some time and focus on... Let, let's spend some time and talk specifically about this phase called needs assessment. Uh, Mark and I just took you through this whole facility development process. Uh, the assumption is, is that, you know, the result is always that you're going to build a building. Well, I'm not so sure that your community is there yet with that decision. I think there's a sense of this building has outlived its useful life. Uh, but I'm not convinced that you got the data behind it, the economic analysis behind it to defend that position and or if that's the right decision. So how do we arrive at what's right for you? What's the best fit for this county? Well, we go through something called the needs assessment. And, and we're going to talk about these tasks that occur. We're going to spend a little bit more detail in this phase leading up to lunch just to talk about the steps that you should take during needs assessment. When you come out to the August program, uh, you're going to spend a little bit more time on this uh, with the case study as well as some of the other pieces. But the needs assessment is really where you begin to form the planning process. You develop this policy group uh, of, of, of folks that are going to work on the project. And one of the things that comes out of this is a mission statement and setting of goals for your community and your criminal justice system. I heard that earlier this week on Tuesday from someone that we ought to be mission and driven value as well as data driven in our decision making. Your values in this community are different than the values of my community, which is the city and county of Denver. And so therefore our criminal justice system looks different. Part of it's based on statutes, Colorado law, we have something legalized that you don't have legalized here, is different, but we heard it's coming, is different than your values here in this community. So it has to be a reflection of that. So in this phase, you develop this mission statement. You also begin to look at what are the legal requirements, what are the standards that we want to adhere to as it relates to our system. Mark talked about Michigan standards, American Correctional Association standards, Americans with Disabilities Act, Prison Rape Elimination Act. There's a number of standards bodies that will drive how your building or how your system functions. So you begin to look at those at this point. You, look, you really go in depth into your existing building during this phase and your limitations. What is the right staffing? What are certain policies and practices within the criminal justice system that affect our building, that affect capacity? You really dig into this during the needs assessment. And you identify options. Mark spent some time discussing a number of options that may present itself in your planning process. Here's where you dig into that. This is where you are planning and you're developing the future roadmap for a community. You're not in design, you're not in construction. Most of what you do during this phase is on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So let's, let's talk about this, this, this first activity. This is where you dig into current policies and practices. You conduct interviews, you evaluate how people move through the criminal justice system at various decision points. And what is the time that it takes for those decisions to occur? The reason you do that is that it identifies opportunities to either change that decision-making process or to speed up that decision. Those policies and practices have a direct effect on that intake spigot in the water barrel. Who comes and how long they stay. 
you look at, look at all kinds of issues during this phase around booking fees and different ways of creating revenue and different opportunities that you have. And you also look at standards in terms of are they mandated or is it something that we can choose to do. So all of that occurs during this first information and collection phase. It's intensive in terms of looking at policies and practices and evaluating standards. Okay. Uh, I had a blank slide in there. It wasn't supposed to be there. Um, so we go then to uh, the second part of the needs assessment, which is collecting data. You've done this before in this county with an earlier uh, master plan that was developed in 2000, I want to say. Rough, rough, roughly around 2000, then updated after that uh, with David Bennett, I believe was the, the firm that was used for that, with Dennis Lieber, known both, worked with them both. They developed a, a master plan for you and they collected, they extracted, they pulled information out of your criminal justice system. I'm going to show you some of the things that you have the ability to pull out. What I don't know is how you can use that information to help make decisions, what reports can be generated. Mm. Uh, but you're, you're in mm. better shape than other communities that we work with in terms of collecting information. So you want to take some time during this phase mm. and again, go back and understand how a person moves through the criminal justice system. What are the decision points, length of time between those decision points, who's involved in that activity from a policy standpoint, then you want to begin to look at who's in custody. Who is coming to our facility? What does the typical inmate look like? Adult? Are they a felony, a misdemeanor? What's their charge categories? On any given day, who do we typically have in custody? Why do we look at that? It helps us define housing capacity. It helps us define who fits into various alternative programs. It helps us to find how we're going to manage that person while they're within the criminal justice system. So during this phase, you're collecting a tremendous amount of information, and eventually, through consensus with constituents that are working on the project, you issue a report. It looks at current policies and practices, and it looks at what the future might hold. This is some charts that we pulled out of your system that demonstrate what you can create within your criminal justice, within your databases. We didn't put any values to them. We didn't do any analysis. We wanted to see if you had the capability to pull something out. We have a lot more charts that were provided to us, a lot more information that was provided to us uh, that we're going to show this morning. But the good news is, is that you can pull some stuff out. What has to be the challenge is, what can we do with it? Well, how can we use it from an analysis standpoint to help us predict the future? This is a chart provided by, I think you did this one, right, Bob? Yes. Or maybe Todd did it. Bob did it. <laughs> it goes back from 2009 to 2014 and just demonstrates average daily population by month <coughs> over those years. So you're able to do a visual that says what's happened within our system. You aren't analyzing it, but it, it, it at least shows you that we have the ability to see that things are changing over time. We've got some trends that are a little bit different. We had another one that looked at count by charge code, whether it's a domestic violence, drunk driving, narcotics. These are grouped in certain categories. Uh, this report was provided to us. This is for the month of December, I believe, 2010, just as an example. And it, and, and it just demonstrates where most of the charges are occurring. I believe the top one is public order, or is it property? Looks like it's a property. Looks like the property category was up and down, and then we have drunk driving. You can see that one go up and down with, 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 a, with, a, with a spike. Um, and then we have public order started higher, then it went a little bit lower. Um, and down along the bottom is domestic violence. So it demonstrates that you have the ability to pull that information out of the system. 
but you can use it from an analytical standpoint and begin to use it to help determine do we have opportunities to do something different or what does it mean for the future. We had another one um, where we just broke it down into civil, felony, and misdemeanor categories. We didn't break it down, you broke it down. And again, for the month of December, it looks like, uh, 2010. And it just demonstrates where the distribution of charges were. The majority in this case were felony. And these are, these are in custody individuals, not within the whole system, but in custody individuals. Uh, misdemeanor tracking fairly close to the felonies, and then certainly civil cases along the bottom as the smallest number. Not unusual with other jurisdictions that we work with, that we're involved in, but just, they, again, a way to begin to look at your inmate and jail population. We then looked at it. We saw a chart that said you're able to look at it by sentence and pretrial. Pretrial population less than your sentenced population. We don't know how you're defining pretrial. Is it that you are free and clear of everything? You're not sentenced on anything? We don't know if you're defining sentence population as if you have three charges and you're sentenced on one, then you are a sentenced individual, not pretrial. So we don't know what's behind that number. <coughs> But what we do know is that you're able to capture some of that information. And so back to the charts that we provided, the good news is, is, is that your system has the information. We heard through some of our conversations that there's difficulty in, in getting some of the reports out that you thought you could when you change systems. I think you changed systems two years ago. Uh, we don't know why that's occurring. Uh, we know that the, we've heard that the county's committed to figuring out how to fix that. Um, but the good news is that you can start some of this needs assessment stuff as you begin this process. You have the ability to pull information out. Uh, it may mean that you use outside resources to help analyze some of that stuff. Uh, but you're not a paper system anymore. You've got, you got the data there. You have the historical data. I don't know how far it goes back, but I'm assuming it goes back pretty far. Uh, and you can pull some of that stuff out and begin to analyze it. That's the good news. So part of this needs assessment is really beginning to dig into some of the data associated with your criminal justice system to begin to understand exactly how you're operating. I would assume and anticipate that you're operating maybe a little bit differently than you did when you did the study in 2000. Policymakers have changed. Programs, new programs have been implemented. Programs that might have been implemented at the time were, were, were decided that they were no longer effective or efficient, so you're not using them anymore. So something has changed, but you have the ability to pull that information out of there. That's good. Okay. One of the next things that, that, that you're going to do during this needs assessment is to begin to look at options alternatives. You've been doing that for quite a period of time. We applaud you for that. You don't stop doing that now. You continue to look at what are the tools that we need in our toolbox to best manage the criminal justice system. And so one of the things that you do as you're looking at options is you begin to look at the seven basic decision points of the criminal justice system. There is, well, this sudden, I can't shine a red light on it. So, um, <coughs> apologize for the, for the uh, small type. Uh, this may be, I think it's on, on one of your handouts. Uh, but you'll see the seven key criminal justice decision points is that you start with arrest and you go then to a decision of pre-trial detention, uh, you go to a decision of whether or not you go to custody, you move through that decision uh, points of whether or not to release from jail, this is still pre-trial, uh, and then you go into a decision point to prosecute, a, a, an adjudication decision, guilt or innocence, 
a sentencing decision, and then whether or not it is local custody or in a different location. So you have a number of different decision points that go all the way through modification of that, that sentence and ultimately release from the criminal justice system. You have the opportunity to affect who is in custody, what happens within the criminal justice system at each one of those decision points. What are some of the things that you're doing now that happen back at arrest? Do you have the ability to have field citations? So, so you have the ability to say, as the arresting agency on the street, I don't have to send this person to custody. I can give them a notice to appear, a field citation. Here's the ticket. Your court date is such and such. Show up, do this. How often does that occur? Okay. What types of charges typically? Do those folks, are they, are they booked into the system at all? Do they have to come to jail or is it done completely in the field? Once they appear in court, they have to come back in order to be booked into the system. But then they're automatically released. Okay. So, so th that initial point in time, there, there is a decision made by the arresting officer or the officer in the street. There's another step. The officer can just say, don't do that again. You know, like, and drive his kind of license. Okay. In Wayne County, they take, they pull your car. Wherever you're at, they pull your car, and you figure out how to your car back. So, so, so you could do something even more than that at, at this phase. That, that, that is a policy decision within the criminal justice system. See, I remember, I was really with respect to it. I understand. I, you know, when I see 300, you know, drivers that license tickets here, you know, if you had 300 people walking home. Maybe it would have an impact. That's right. But you're, but you're still concerned about public safety. No, I'm driving a license so much. You're not familiar with that driver's license. Every time you get caught, it's $1,000. So if you have to send me 10 or 12 of them, there's no way they'll get your license back. Right. right. Absolutely. It, 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 that's a tough one. But your, but your point is well taken. You have different things to do at the arresting decision point that affect who's coming to jail and who's not. You may have some current practices that are in place, but also during this phase you explore other ones that can be implemented and you put some cost associated with that and what it means to public safety. What about this issue to, to, to release from jail? What, what happens during, during that process that, that gives, you, gives you options? Can you release before they go to first appearance or advisement? Can they make bond? Okay. So, so you, you have a, a monetary process in place. Does anything else happen? Can, can, can you, as, as a uh, corrections officer, release somebody on their own recognizance from the booking area? Okay. Most of the time. Most of the time they do? There has to be an interim Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, so, so there's something that's occurring at the release point that gives you some options. So during this needs assessment, you're going to look at release and say, is there other things that we could be doing? And put some value to that. I don't know what's going to be right for your community. All I know is during this process, you evaluate that decision. From a sentencing perspective, does everybody get sentenced to the state prison? Okay. How, how many are sentenced locally, if, if you had to do a, do a percentage? How much? 20%. 20 percent of all sentencing go to the state prison? Of felonies. Of felonies. In our state, right now, but the Department of Corrections, state corrections, they make a recommendation what used to be correct in a prison term without county prison term because of the cost. So there's a battle between the counties and the state who should house moderate level felonies. Okay. Drug, you know, drug drivers and you get, so, um, I think you're 
Oh, yeah, we went through that with uh, drunk driving third offense I talked to you about. That. Yep. It used to be every drunk driving third went to prison yep. back 20 years ago. And then the state started paying for incarceration locally, so they wouldn't have the expense. And so we went through a long period where we were seeing one-year jail sentences. And nowadays, uh, drunk driving thirds get offered sobriety for it on a regular basis. Right. They don't do a day in jail unless they screw up on their probation. So, 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 so with that population, just, just listening to that dynamic, you've gone through a number of evolutions of different ways of handling a response to that behavior. Yes. And, and, and that's what you do during the needs assessment, is that you go through these decision points, and even if you add other decision points that are appropriate for you, you look at what is the range of options that are available and figure out which one might be a better fit for you. It's got to be a local decision driven by data. Well, so, so you involve that person in the decision-making process. That we figure that we figure that policy into the <coughs> equation of what your needs are. So, 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 so again, we, we have to make sure that we understand what that dynamic is to your criminal justice system. The reality is, is that policymakers aren't in those positions forever. So policymakers change, policies and practices change. And so, understood. Okay. So, so we figure all of that into the equation, looking at these decision points, looking at your current policies and practices, and that helps us define need. I couldn't help but add, though. Why would, you know, our circuit court judges have probably two of the highest prison firm rates in the state of Michigan. That being said, with the alternative courts that we have, and the fact that all the OUIL trees go to get off the sobriety court, the people that come to our circuit court, if they're found guilty by their peers, the judges are pretty much compelled to send them to prison. Now, we have given those people all the opportunities yes. that we can prior to actually even coming to trial before our circuit court judges. When the jury of their peers finds them guilty in the circuit court, they get sentenced to prison. However, Re recently I was in a meeting and uh, the point was made that Tom Power had the highest prison term rate of any judge in the, uh, in the state of Michigan and most of the people in the room stood up and clapped. I think that tells you what our community wants. Sure, absolutely. Uh, we have a however over here. <laughs> I have some figures about that. They do have the highest prison term rates in the state, but there are two tiers. There's level one offenders and level two offenders. When you take out level one offenders are those who should go to prison. They're rape, homicide, robbery, those serious crimes. When you take those out, the prison pen rates really are not that high. They're roughly around the state average of 20 something percent. So you have to see both the patients. Even on the high end, 60% are paying over. Exactly. So. But, but, Sorry, I was late. So, so, so <laughs> just, just listen, listen to this conversation for a moment. We raise a point that has an impact on capacity within the criminal justice system. And listen to the difference that is coming out among you. This is powerful. This is what you continue to do during this needs assessment process by involving policymakers and other voices around the table discussing this. Because you have the ability to influence some of that behavior or to understand it and to begin to anticipate and plan for the future. That's the importance of this exercise. Mark and I don't have a dog in the fight. We're leaving uh, tomorrow uh, and, and, and this is your community. Even if you hire consultants to help you with this process, it is still your community. And you have the ability to influence 
and plan for the future during this process by looking at data, looking at decision points, collectively viewing it together because you'll have differences of opinion on what the data says. We all know how data can be utilized to oftentimes paint a certain picture. That's not what you want to occur during the needs assessment process. It has to be objective and independent as you look at these decision points and the data and information that you collect to evaluate it. One of the things that's going to be important as you go through those decision points is to look at the level of alternative usage. Are you doing everything that you think is appropriate in Grand Traverse County? If you did more, what's the cost associated with that? What's the benefit to the community? If you added more to community corrections as an example, can you get more people out of custody? Are there other programs and services that can be provided within our community that are enhancements to community corrections, enhancements to probation, whatever it might be, that fit within the values of our community that also maintain public safety and the risk to the public? So during this process, you explore those alternatives. You explore those options. And you evaluate each one of them based on the values of your community, how it relates to public safety, and the cost benefit of each one of those. And you begin to develop options, as Mark and I discussed. One of the things that's going to happen during the needs assessment is that you're going to begin to project future capacity. I didn't fully look at the earlier study, but I can only anticipate that there was a projection model in there. I've heard the number 250 at some point was a projection going out into the future at some point. Whatever those numbers were, they need to be updated based on what's occurred since they were developed. But you need to get a sense of the future, and the projections are based on the options and the alternatives that you've looked at before. So it's a comprehensive view of going forward. And again, it's based on your data coming out of your system. <coughs> you evaluate facilities uh, and what is needed for those facilities, whether it is the jail or alternative programs. Those specialty courts require space. Work release requires space. If you're looking at regionalization, it requires space. So all of that comes into the needs assessment. And finally, you come up with a series of recommendations. Needs assessment takes typically four to six months, depending on how decisions are made, how we get policymakers around the table. But typically, that report includes a discussion around alternatives, a discussion around changes to policies and practices, a discussion around new facility or renovations or options supported by the data that you've developed from within your criminal justice system. And that needs assessment master plan sets the stage for functional programming as it relates to the facility and to the other aspects uh, of the facility development process. This is where, in this phase, you have the greatest ability to influence the future. Not during design. You've already made a decision at that point of building. But during this phase, you truly chart the future for the county. So we encourage you, if you go forward, that you spend significant amounts of time on this phase of the project. I think Captain Hall was the one that said, we want to make sure we follow the right steps. We want to make sure that we go forward appropriately. If you're going to go forward with this process, we think you, we know that you have to undertake this stage, this phase of the facility development process. Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I asked you a little bit ago, um, a dumb question, where are your favorite jails? Uh, what I really want to know is where you think uh, processes, what, what process works the best for the I also want to know uh, where I'm going to find 
uh, information regarding what communities have tried that hasn't worked. I do not have any where near uh, the experience that just about everybody else in this room has. So what I want to do is I want to be able to research. I want to be able to come into this process with some kind of knowledge. Where am I going to find it? Where are the websites? Um, I guess that's it. Uh, it's Mark to chime in too. National Institute of Corrections has a website. Uh, Nick, Nick, and I see National Information Center. I think uh, is the website. Or just go to nic.org. I think it might be. Yeah. Um, they have a resource library. Uh, they have a section on evidence-based practices. Uh, they have a section on facility planning. Uh, and so you're going to get a tremendous amount of information right out of there of what works what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a publication actually called What Works. Uh, several. Yeah. They, they produce an amazing amount, um, or and they're also a clearinghouse for an amazing amount of information. It's, I think a day does not go by now that I don't get an email from NIC about, about a, a new document or um, yeah. a, um, a web, webinar. A, a seminar over the web. They're they're always putting out um, and disseminating more information. So they're they're a terrific resource. So so that's going to be a way to gain a lot of publications, a lot of information that's coming out. You're going to be introduced to some of that in Colorado, uh, but that's where I would start. Uh, they're going to give you a list of, of counties that are there that are doing certain things. You're going to hear about case studies of, of places that are working. So that's where, that's where I would start with trying to get the information. Um, where do I have a favorite? Um, it's, it's a subjective question. Um, I have favorite buildings that, that, that I've visited where folks have done a good, a good planning process. Uh, I'm trying to think where I would have a favorite in terms of how folks are processing uh, individuals um, in terms of looking at alternatives and looking at options. Uh, Douglas County, Kansas, I think, is a good example of a reentry uh, process there. Uh, on the NIC website is a link to, oh, what's it called? What's the reentry thing? Um, I'll, 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 I'll find it or I'll, I'll think about it. There's a link to, they have, they have a grant that is out for a number of uh, of counties that are investing in changing the way individuals flow through the system and the way that they return back to the community and the resources that are applied to that. So there's a way, there's, there's six or eight model counties. Uh, City and County of Denver is one of them uh, that is doing a lot of that stuff. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what the name of it is. Just, but, just think about it. Yeah, I will, I will. Um, there we go. Thank you so much. Prisoner Reentry Initiative or something like that. Um, I was that, drawing a blank. It's now called, there, there's a jail initiative that, that is related to it, and it is, it is the individual leaving, leaving the jail. Oftentimes it may be them coming back from the prison, but it's also those leaving out of the jail itself. Okay, good. So, 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 so th there, there's a number of initiatives that, that are going to be homegrown, my word, that are going to happen here that are going to be important to look at on, on the horizon as you begin to develop your, your needs assessment. Um, this is the phase where, from a cost standpoint, it, it is the cheapest dollar you're going to spend in the planning process. Doing research, collecting information, evaluating that. It's expensive from the standpoint of your involvement. It takes a commitment of time from policymakers to participate in this process. It can't be done in a vacuum. I don't anticipate that this county would allow that to occur. Uh, and oftentimes counties involve the citizens into, into this process. That's a decision you make locally about how much you involve the local citizens in this process as well as key policymakers. 
the intent is, is at the end of the day, you have a very clear roadmap of what the future is going to be, and you've done your cost-benefit analysis to determine what's the best option or range of options for your county. Nothing will come without a cost implication. Even doing nothing will have a cost implication because you will continue to have to spend money on maintaining that building, and if you're housing inmates in other jurisdictions, there's going to be a cost associated with that. So you have to be clear that not, there is no free lunch as it's coming in, other than the one that's going to be provided soon. There is no free lunch for that activity, uh, for the policies and decisions that you make. Uh, and so that's part of the needs assessment process. Okay. Any other questions or comments? We've sped up our agenda a little bit today. Um, so we have one piece left to do after lunch. That's okay with you. We'll, we'll break, uh, take a break, and then I'm assuming lunch will be served soon. Yes. Will you be reviewing all the uh, alternative courts that we have as to how they're operating and whether or not they're operating efficiently? No. But that should be a big part of the needs assessment process. Absolutely. It's always when you look at bed needs, um, you should look at current community uh, corrections Absolutely. Mark's, Mark's, Mark's response is appropriate. We aren't doing it as part of a two-day program. Our, our goal was to look to see if you're doing some of that stuff. The answer is yes. Whether it's effective or not, that, that, those have to be part of this needs assessment process. If you're doing something that's not effective, either discontinue doing it or make it, make it more effective. If it is really effective, then maybe you want to enhance it and do some more of it. I, I had a chance to observe it. I, thought, I think we're doing some phenomenal work in our alternative Good. Uh, we got some great people that are really caring about what they're doing. It, it, it's always going to beg the question, are we doing everything that we can and therefore we need to do X or can we do a little bit more of, of, of what we're doing now and X is reduced, whatever X might be. That's part of the evaluation that you're going to undertake. When Jim and I both worked in, in corrections many, many years ago, there was very little research then about what works, what was effective. The advantage now of, of you doing a needs assessment study is, there's, um, and when you look at the NIC website, you see there's so much more, um, there's not a whole lot on buildings, but there's a whole lot on, on what works, effective alternatives, effective programs within jails. Um, a lot about management, about involving communities, many things that would be used for you. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, payment. And this bug that went through on the jail tour, and um, we are required, as I understand it, to keep records for uh, uh, okay. 10 years in on paper. Oh, that wonderful records room that yes. was in the garage. Uh, it is my understanding that, yes, it is my understanding that that is required to be of the state. Do you know if other states have that requirement or not? If so, what states do not? If all states have that requirement, is there some kind of push that the National Institute of Russia it makes no sense? I mean, it would not be today's technology, but uh, for the age. Uh, at least to me. And I'm old. Uh, <coughs> So is there a push nationally to ask legislatures to be able to... I mean, I, the, 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 there's a push at the federal level to be as paper-friendly as you can be. Uh, is, is that a national initiative that transfers to states and or counties? Uh, I know that every project I've been involved in, there is a requirement for a hard copy to be, to be maintained for a certain period of time. Sometimes it's only related to a capital offense. Sometimes it's related to all crimes. It depends on the jurisdiction. I know that um, 
most jurisdictions that, 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 that I have worked with are, are taking steps to scan and, and to go paperless with as much as they can. It's a workload issue in terms of going back and scanning in documents and creating those, those databases. Uh, but is there a national uh, push? I don't know that there's a national push. Um, and I would have to think, I don't know if the National Association of Counties has a initiative that is around paperless or anything like that, so, yeah. It, 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 I, I have to say, in all, in all of our tours, I've seen records rooms in, 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 in interesting locations. I think that's a first for a records room as part of the uh, vehicle garage. I don't think I've seen that before. So we'll applaud you for that, for being unique from that perspective. Um, we do a lot of firsts. Exactly, exactly. So That's right. I didn't see if it was sprinkled. I didn't take a look at that. So. Uh, probably, probably is so. Okay. Anything else before we break? Turn the mic off. Have lunch. While you're eating, Mark and I will put our heads together, figure out the next presentation, and we're ahead of schedule. So hopefully that's a good thing.
Jim said this is uh, the second second to the last piece and we'd like to make it interactive. So I just asked are, are we are we ready and um, I think you, you, you all took it to me and are we ready to continue with our presentation but I meant it in another way too this this next piece is on on readiness um, and it basically asked the question is is travel in Traverse County ready to move forward what what do you all think is is the county to ready to move forward and do I need to be more clear as to move forward with what because some of you may be thinking move forward with building a new jail and I don't I don't mean that we don't mean that we mean to move forward with the needs assessment process to, um, like a number of you and others have said, to collect data, to, to analyze data, to look at different options. So Bob's shaking his head. And, um, are, are most of you, um, most of you ready to, to, to move forward with the process? It doesn't mean spending any money. It doesn't mean, um, Necessarily, it, it 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 doesn't necessarily mean mean building or renovating or changing alternatives, but it would be looking at the need for for all those and how things could work better. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to formalize that? Should it be a formal process that is a group of different? Uh, individuals from the criminal justice system yes. uh, that meet on a regular basis and go over data and how do you have like a format or a formula for how you would start in one place and end it and know when you're you complete all the steps. Yeah, and you ch chime in too, Jim, but yes, and it, um, when, you, when you worked on a county jail project <coughs> previously, was there a committee of um, with representatives from different people from each of the justice agencies and county manager and maybe facilities person, that sort of thing? I worked on the third iteration of the third committee that worked on it. Okay. And we, yes, that is one thing that we recommend is, is um, and different communities call it di different things, but basically a, a jail study committee or a jail planning committee, um, and it can not just look at at the jail but improving the the whole justice system maybe focusing on how the justice system affects the jail like like um community corrections and other elements that affect affect bed needs so what, what i have seen be, be powerful with other jurisdictions is that you answer a couple of questions in the beginning uh, the first is uh, uh is it on it says it's on. Is that good? Okay. okay. Um, the, the first is uh, to, to identify uh, if you're able to begin to define what the problem is. So you focus on that. And so we, we saw some head nodding saying, yes, we're ready to start. Uh, and that means, are you ready to commit resources to this effort? And resources come from a, from a number of different places. Uh, and your time and your commitment uh, is going to be paramount to the success of any planning effort. Your ability to collect, analyze, evaluate data, uh, put a green light on. And so I don't know what else to do. Uh, okay, do I turn it off and then on or draw that again? again. Now the green light's on. No, there's not. We're very quick. Yeah. Hello. No. No. Want to come up here? Yeah. Can you give 
handheld bell detector. Is that working? That's working. You got it now. How's that? Yeah. I feel like I'm in a karaoke bar. Where's the monitor so we can read the music? Um, so, so when we're talking about readiness, what, what, is, what is interesting about this dynamic is that, is that how you define readiness is different for each jurisdiction. And Mark's got a couple of slides that they're, they're going to make this, make this more clear, but for us the question is, are you, have, you, have you identified that you need to move forward with something? And throughout our interviews, throughout this week, throughout this morning, we think it's pretty clear to us that you know that you have to go through some subsequent steps to go forward with this process, particularly probably the needs assessment. Um, Is this not working? No. Oh, oh okay. Um, so, so to that end, it, it, it's going to focus on commitment of resources, commitment of time, uh, your ability to identify potential stumbling blocks and how you're going to address those. We asked that in a number of our interviews. What do you see as, as, as potential roadblocks, potential impacts to a good planning process? That's going to tie back into your question about who is involved in the process. Who are the folks that sit around the table? You don't bring everybody around the table that, that are those folks that agree with you. You want a diverse group of individuals, diverse opinions, um, and you want the ability to facilitate the conversation within that group as you go forward. You may have a large planning committee and then you may have some subsequent smaller groups of folks, but you want the criminal justice system and the community represented throughout the planning process. I think that's key. Yeah. I, th I think the most important word on this, on this slide that's currently up is the, is, is the word buy-in. Um, I was just thinking of an, uh, of an analogy that I've experienced as a parent a long time ago, and that's PTA meetings. I would go to PTA meetings, and it's the, the parents who, who most need to be involved with, with their teachers that are unfortunately often, often, often not there. And it, we, we know that mo most of you are, are on board or close to being on board is as far as realizing that um, something needs to happen, that this needs assessment at least needs to go forward, need to at least look at building a new jail or, or reducing the population or renovation or most likely a, a, a combination of things, including maybe tweaking some alternatives to incarceration. Um, but it's, re it's really critical to, to, to get, get buy-in and have a s strategy to continue developing buy-in. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Some of the people that we um, interviewed told us that if there was a bond referendum, it would fail because school referendums have, have failed and the county, a lot of taxpayers don't even want to pay for improving their roads or, or, or doing anything. So, um, and you know, we, we haven't looked at funding. We don't know if that's necessary. Um, it's clear you need to do something, and whatever, whatever it is, even if it's not building beds, is, is, is going to, to cost. So it's, re it's really important to develop a strategy that, that expands buy-in and gets naysayers on board. And that's one advantage um, of having a criminal justice planning committee or a jail planning committee or whatever you call it. And the number of ones that I've worked with with other counties, and I'm sure Jim will say the same thing, you bring people on board that, that aren't on the same page, but by them going through the whole process together, they are much more likely to be on the same page and, and to, to reach consensus. Um, so that, that really is a key, key ingredient, yes. Are you bringing a facilitator in for that? Uh, is, they, that, is that usually an outside facilitator that brings that to be able to do that, or do you try and do that within the uh, uh, confines of the county government? The way I always answer that question is the county has to identify uh, who's going to be involved in the process, and then to identify what resources you have locally. Um, I think most often we see communities that bring in an outside 
consultant, facilitator, person to work with them on the project uh, because it's their way of gaining the most objectivity in the process. Uh, you always hear the, the um, um, concern sometimes that consultants are only, go, you know, they're, you're, you're gonna, they're, they're gonna give you lip service and, and give you what you want. Um, I think that's, at least in my experience, that's a misnomer. Um, if you have a consultant that's only doing that, then you've got the wrong person there. But most communities use some type of an outside facilitator. In some cases, it's a local college and they have someone there who has the ability and, and the means of, 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 of working with you on the needs assessment. In other cases, you identify your resources and say, we think we're gonna get some outside expertise that has been doing this for quite a while and, and, and have them involved in, in the project. When we did the Blue Ribbon Jail Committee previously, we had about 20 citizens. Sorry about that. Uh, when we, hello? You, you got it. Okay, when we did the Blue Ribbon Jail Committee, we used about 20, 25 citizens of the community representing a huge cross-section. Uh, the chairman, actually, the, the two ch gentlemen that co-chaired that committee was, one was the local superintendent of schools, and the other was a well-known clergyman from the community. And it worked out very well. You know, it was, it was a very long and tedious process for some of us. Uh, it took us about 13 months, but, but we really did get good data and, and good information out of that. The recommendation got us a short-term fix, which has gained us 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, the long-term fix is where we're at today. Yep. You know, but that being said, we also enhanced through that process, you know, massive expansions to community corrections yep. and alternative yeah. sentencing. So, you know, the process does work. It, it, you know, unfortunately, like Chris calls it glacial speed. Uh, I, I don't, you know, for those of you that know me, you realize I don't do glacial speed very well. So uh, <laughs> patience isn't my greatest virtue, but, but the process does work. And I think that's what we need to do is just make sure that we keep moving forward with the process. I think that's the concern yeah. that I have is that we, we've, been, we've been stalled here. We made this recommendation 10 years ago. We knew that we needed to, we, the short term fix was going to get us that but we do still needed to move forward with the long-term ob objective, and we didn't do that. We've been stalled there. Now here we are 10 years later, and we are at a crucial point where we need to do something soon. Well, one of the things that is, is interesting about your community here is, is that uh, instead of calling it glacial speed, deliberate decision-making, um, you had the experience of that process. You've done it before. Many jurisdictions, this is brand new to them. So you have that experience base, and you have a, a number, a significant number of policymakers who are still here that were involved in those earlier processes. So you know what worked for you then, and you know what didn't work for you at that point in time. So you do have that experience base. Um, and, and yes, decision making is going to take time. Uh, it's going to be slower than many, many of us think. But the value is, is that at the end of the day, you typically have a much better decision made. When do you start that committee put together? Do we do it after we come back? From my question is, is when do you start that process of putting that committee together? You know, we've had that discussion a little bit as to should we start to look for those people now or wait until after the groups come back from uh, uh, the August session? Well, let, let's do this. Let, 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 let's, let's abandon the rest of the slides. There's, there's only a few. And let, let's go into what you see as next steps for you. And, and let's identify three, four, or five next steps. And so the, so, so the question on the floor is, let me ask you this way. Do, do you need a committee? Is, is, is there a, a, a fair a agreement to that, that you want a committee process? Yeah, needed for public buy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Transparency, public buy-in, and you get a better product. Okay, so we know we need need a committee. So yeah, and, and another key point on, on on this slide is is expertise, and we talked a little bit about that before to ha to bring in um, different types of of, of in-house expertise, and in, in most counties also um, hire a consultant, but. Um, especially important is to involve people from all elements of the justice system and like you did before uh, citizens concerned concern groups 
groups that are that may not buy into something initially are there grants or something available for this process through NIC or NACO or someplace else that we might be able to access funds to be able to help us go through this process? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Nothing through NIC. Yeah. There, there's continued technical assistance, but I'm not aware of anything that is going to, go, going to fund the planning or the needs assessment portion of this, this study. Of, of this process and so um, so what, what 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 do you see as as issues that might get in the way of, of a good planning process funding, funding? Number yeah but Fun, funding for the process or funding for whatever happens after the process, process. for the process what, 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 what else might might get in the way right yeah okay. and we've heard that in some of our interviews too there's some people that think be, you know one of the disadvantages of running a jail that looks so good and is and is quiet is and and where overcrowding looks like it's being managed okay is that there's some people that are, are not yet convinced that anything needs to be done. Um, what, what else? What else is going to hurt you in this process? Funding, lack of participation? Does the community view this as a problem? Okay, so community. Right now, they put them in jail, they go through the process, they're taken care of. So, what's your problem? So, public information, public education is going to be a potential stumbling block. Well, education with decision makers. Ah, mm -hmm. right. And you're definitely taking some good steps as far as go going to Colorado next month and becoming more educated. Well, the other piece that we recognize, the other piece that we recognize is the fact that uh, because this is a five-year process, and the county commissioners are elected for two years, there's three county boards between here and the time we open the doors. Yeah, so well, that that's a that's a big challenge. Cause Absolutely. And that's a potentially very expensive challenge. Is um, as, as um, Dave was say, saying earlier, if a, if a sheriff changes his mind halfway through construction or after a building's built, there's, you, you can't go back and change the design of it. Mark? I think another thing that we need to remember is that throughout the entire process, whatever we ultimately do or don't do or whatever, that the problems that have brought us here today have not gone away. They still persist and they will yeah. continue to get worse or, I mean, the building's not going to heal itself. No. Uh, the numbers of the uh, inmates population and the bed problems isn't going to heal itself. So those, those issues are still there, uh, potentially getting worse, um, but we can't let those negatively impact the decision-making process where the committee feels like it's got to hurry up and come up with a decision because these problems are beating on the door so true good good point and obviously facility facility planning and design and construction takes a long time um, but that that reminds me there are other other actions that committees can can take to help um, as interim solutions like like uh, looking at expanding things that can be implemented much quicker like expanding community corrections or um, in expanding other alternatives to incarceration that could that aren't going to solve any problems might um, alleviate <coughs> the, the problems for a while Yeah, I can say you expect to be doing this digitized. I think another thing that uh, we have a judge that's probably going to be retiring, we're going to be losing a judge 
that is probably the implementer of all the specialty courts. And so how are we going to handle that and whether or not we're willing to fund that position after we lose a judge to be able to do that. And we're also, we're a three county, uh, our judges uh, handle three different counties right. and how they handle that and where do they work with each of that to be able to make that. And that could be a challenge for us, but it also could be the time that we have to do something different. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think uh, there's going to be a dual program going on. <clears throat> if it takes five years to build a jail, as that's happening, our problems are growing. So we have to have an aggressive interim plan uh, until the jail gets built. Right. Absolutely. Well, you're also fortunate, not many other counties are, that you have. Um, a jail nearby with empty beds that is willing and able to lease lease you beds, and it's not that that far. So it's not a good long-term solution, but um, you're compared to many other places, you're you're fortunate that that that's available. Okay. Um, uh, I I wanted to you know I, some of the conversation, and I know uh, uh, Sunny firmly believes that we need a new jail and uh, Captain Hall um, I think believes we need a new jail but I don't want to put words in his mouth I'm not there yet I know I, I'm not there yet yeah. um, I know that I recognize a problem when I see one we have a problem the question in my mind is what is the best um, route to take to address the problem and that's why I support the needs assessment. Yes. Uh, you know, it, if it expands community corrections and keeps people out of jail, I think that's a good thing uh, and allows people to rehabilitate mm -hmm. themselves. You know, I, uh, I talked to Captain Hall about this when we were going through the jail. I said, you know, I firmly believe that people that have good habits um, you know, continue those good habits. Good habits are easy, harder to develop than bad habits are. But you know, there's not a whole lot of opportunity there for um, inmates to develop good habits. I'm seeing people sleeping all yes. the time. Right. Uh, so you know, maybe that's something that we can. I, I mean, I just don't know. Well, what, 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 what's intriguing about this this dynamic that's going on right now is that that. I bet both of you agree we need to do something. You have differences in what that something is, how it's defined, but there is at least agreement that action is required. So the question becomes, what is that action? How do we define it? What's the implementation plan for it? That's the important thing. Um, I will offer going through your facility, it has challenges just because of its age and everything. And so there has to be a conversation at some point about how do we continue to use that building? What's the best use of that resource? It's an expensive resource, it's an expensive sanction. So the limits on its use is a, benef a benefit to the community just from an economic standpoint. But you've gotta go through it because you're realizing that you have to do something. That's, that, that's the real chat, that's the real intrigue that I see here between the two of you as key policy makers in this county. Yeah, and... <laughs> <laughs> as he as he should be yes I should be um, yeah it's my punishment uh, the uh, he chose that <laughs> the uh, the thing about uh, you know these decision points that we're looking gonna look at in this needs assessment uh, we're gonna reach a point where we're gonna have for example let's take the issue of good time time off for good behavior mm -hmm. Uh, some counties have time off for good behavior. Uh, if they're in a community corrections program, they're getting uh, their GED class. Uh, they get two for one. You know, they get a day out for every two days. They're good, uh, and they get out a day early. Uh, in some, it's five to one. Some, it's you know, it's much less liberal than that. So you can really affect the average length of stay in right. your jail and basically reduce the jail population by just manipulating the good time policy. Yep. Um, and there's going to be disagreement about what is the right thing to do. Absolutely. Um, you ask the prosecutor, you're going to get one. You're going to ask the judge, you're going to get a different. Yeah. You're going to ask the 
jail staff, you'll get a different answer. Uh, and you'll ask county commissioners and it'll be all over the map. Right. So putting a committee together to talk about that <laughs> is going to not sometimes lead to unanimity of opinion. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I guarantee it. So how do you work through those and still come to consensus uh, when one person says, well, if you'd only change this, whatever it may be, good time, just an example, you could reduce that population. You wouldn't need to build a new jail now. How do you get through those in a committee like this? And well, well, part of it is um, having the right players around the table. And that doesn't mean that you select the right players. Is that, is that the right players are willing to sit around the table. Those that can influence those decisions. They're around the table. You've got to collect objective, independent information and present it. And, and to show the impact of every one of those decisions or potential options. One of the things that you first do with a committee like that is that, is that you, you, you brainstorm and list all the potential options that might be considered, as far-fetched as they might be. And then you, you begin to ask questions about each one of those, and then you can go collect information and data about each one of those and demonstrate what the impact might be. I'm a firm believer that if you present the information in, in the correct way and everybody understands it, believes it, identifies with it, that, that, that the consensus percolates and evolves itself, is that people come to agreement. If you reach an impasse and someone says, I just absolutely will not and cannot support that, you accept it and you move on. I have a project where I'm helping a county implement pretrial services. Um, it's been contentious at certain times because the sheriff has a very strong and legitimate concern about drunk drivers in a pretrial services program. He flat out said to the group of policymakers in a public forum, I will not support third time DWI offenders in that program. Flat out. I don't care what the data says to me. The data showed that they were lower risk to reoffend and lower risk to not appear in court. But he says, I just can't do it. We said, fine, move on. We accept it. And that's what you have to do in a process like that. Okay. Pass the mic. Yeah. I think that we're probably all in agreement that our jail is not sufficient to handle the inmates that are in there and keep the employees that we have safe. And I think probably your report's probably going to bear that out. So the challenge of us is not so much uh, that we're going to need a new jail, but how are we going to do the jail so that it's more uh, efficiently, it can be more efficiently run. If it can't be done within the confines that we currently have, then are we going to have to build something else? And I think that's probably more of my question than all the other programs that we have. That we need to do something with the jail that we currently have. Sure, we can put our people in. We can, we can get them out. We can get them taken care of. We can get them through the courts. They are going to be incarcerated. It's going to be taken care of. But is it efficient? And is it safe for the employees? And, and, and that, that's, that's a big part of the evaluation of the needs during, during the needs assessment. Yeah. If you're going to continue to use that building, what should be its intended use and how should it function and operate? And I would admit that the building does have challenges. There, there is no doubt about it. Right. Um, just walking through it. It's well run. It's clean. But it has limitations simply because your needs and your population and the folks utilizing that facility have changed since it was first opened in 1964. It happens. And because you've had so many constraints every time you've added to it or, or renovated it, everything, you, you have a very small site and, and there were existing buildings to, to, to work around. Um, the very positive thing that you've done, and I don't know if we emphasize this enough, is that you didn't leap at the first time you needed to consider capacity issues and build a new facility. You asked that question, what can we do differently? So you truly took an objective look at things. You have to do that again. Your decisions and your recommendations will be different than they were then, merely because things have changed over time. But you're using the same process. And part, part of the dissemination of data that 
we think is really effective is what, what, what we did yesterday, uh, take a, a tour of the facility and encourage that to continue to uh, occur because from the outside, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look, look so bad, but going in and, and, and seeing um, a lot of the challenges and limitations will help um, convince people that something, something needs to happen, at least, you know, to start off with a needs assessment study. So, 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 Mark, why don't we go to next steps? What do you think? Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just we'll just wrap wrap this thing up because we we've kind of danced around the slides in terms of are you ready or not? Um, I think I think that you're chopping at the bit to start now. Are you ready in terms of putting things together? I'm not 100 percent sure of that. But if we can, as a group, for the last thing that we do today, um, and we'll take as much time as needed. Uh, but as as a group. Collectively think of if you had to identify four things that you consider to be next steps in this process. Give us, give us what those four things are and let's put some, some time to it in terms of when you expect things to be finished and who's going to participate in maybe helping make some of those decisions. So, so as a group, what do you think is the next, the next thing you're going to do after Mark and I leave? Probably applaud and say, wow, those guys are gone. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, but 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 what what do you see you know come Monday? Receive your report and, and disseminate what's in it. Okay, so 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 is there agreement to that 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 you're probably going to wait before you have some conversation about this until you get our document? We'll probably have it to you sometime in October, so that'll be good, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Are they still awake? <laughs> uh, no, our report will come out. Uh, usually between two and four weeks. You'll have it certainly before you go to NIC, because um, part of it is we don't get paid until the report's done. So, so you'll have that. So, so kind of a next step is wait to get this body of information from, from Mark and Jim. Uh, I will offer that the report's probably going to be structured such that um, we'll, we'll, we'll describe what's occurred over the last couple of days, who we've interviewed, what has been a general run of comments and observations. We'll spend some time and talk about your building. Uh, there'll be those pieces in, in the report. We'll talk a little bit about data uh, and what we see as uh, the advantages and the benefits that you have of the data that's within your system. And then we'll capture some recommendations in terms of what we see as, as your next steps, kind of building on what you're doing up here. Okay, so our report. So we're responsible for producing it. Where does it go? Goes to the sheriff, doesn't it? Yes. Sheriff is he? Did the sheriff sign the letter by himself, or was it jointly the sheriff and the chair of the county? I think it was the sheriff. Okay. I it it, it I jurisdictions do it differently. I think Mr. Jackson wanted it from the sheriff. Okay. So so this is going back to the sheriff. Um, I can't imagine for any reason at all that that he would not share it quickly with others. Uh, it goes back in electronic format. So, so the main person that's involved with this on the county side is the sheriff. And it's up to him to present that, however fashion is necessary, to the rest of the group. So let's just put a date on this. Today is July 12th, or, sorry, June 12th. Um, you're coming in August. Let's choose, what's that first Friday in July? That's the 4th. Fourth. Fourth, fourth. So let's, let's make it the... Um, no, let's make it the Monday after that. What's the Monday after the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th? July 7th. We'll put a date in July 7th. Does that work for you? Or sooner. Or sooner. Absolutely. Okay. I'd like to see it on the uh, Public Health and Safety Committee's agenda. Which would be the first Wednesday in July. Oh, so the first Wednesday is the 2nd. Uh, they just meet once a month. Public Health and Safety Committee's. First the county board meets every Wednesday, but public health and safety is the county board meet in the evening? Six o'clock. Six o'clock at night, that committee meets during the day? No, the committee no. meets at six o'clock in the evening. Six p.m. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday at six. But the county board meets on the, on, on the first Wednesday? No. Public health and safety we, meet, we, are, we are a committee of the whole. All seven commissioners sit on all four committees. Okay. Got it. <laughs> so why don't we put the second down there also, and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. 
Yes. Okay. And so you're pretty sure that the sheriff will agree to share I will make sure you get yeah. the okay. So we'll work. We just have to follow protocol. I've never, I've yet to have a project where it wasn't shared. I can't imagine that. Yeah. I mean, he's on notice that the report's coming. Okay. So that, that that's step number one is to wait on Mark and I to get our report. What's number two? Starts eliciting public participation in the needs assessment. So it's beginning to to form the committee. Does that committee have to be? Um, Authorized, endorsed, blessed by the Board of County Commissioners? Are you called the... I think we've already talked about that. So. So, so, so you have the... So it doesn't have to... Some counties I work with, they have... No committees can be in place unless the board authorizes that committee because of Sunshine Laws and Public Meeting Acts and other places. It's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to disagree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, this is a criminal justice system analysis. We are looking at data. We have to make sure we gather the data and have it available. And then the purpose of the committee is to analyze that data. Now, yes, the public should be involved, but first and foremost, the judges, the sheriff and the jail administration, uh, the probation people, the community corrections people, all those, uh, I'm going to go as far as friend of the court, uh, the, um, all those players need to be at the table, and they need to be in agreement about what the mission is, you know, how they're going to spend their time Absolutely. analyzing that data, because all the decision points that you're analyzing are their decision points. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that need to analyze them, and they're the ones that have to decide what they can and what they won't do. Okay. So, so, so two issues. One is you all decide what the committee structure is that works best for you whether you have citizen participation, whether it comes at a different point in time. We don't have a dog in that fight. We don't, it, it's what works for you. My question is, is this committee, is it a function of the, are you called Board of County Commissioners or just Board, board of County board Commissioners? Of course. Does the Board of County Commissioners have to establish this committee by, by order and authorize it to meet? No, but you know, the only thing that I see their role in doing is facilitating okay. this process and you know, suggesting that we have this committee to do this because it's very important that the people in the system, people part of the part that are part of the criminal justice system, are the ones that are buying into this committee process. So, who takes the lead in establishing this committee? If, if the task is to form the committee, who's the who, whom are the primary people responsible for it? Chair, county administrator, board of county commissioners, chief judge. Who is it? Who's the single person? Who's the leader? Who's the leader? Yes, exactly. Who establishes the committee? Not necessarily chairs it, but who says, here's, here's who we're going to have on the committee? Who establishes the criteria? I think we'll probably have the Board of Commissioners will be doing that in, in relationship with the judges. Okay. Okay. And then that's, if that's what's going to work, we just need to get, I think you need to focus on if the task is to form the committee, who's driving that bus? And so we're saying the county commissioners are in agreement with the courts. Okay. Sheriff may have a little different opinion, but that's okay. Well, the sheriff will be part of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and when you come out to the pony program, those of you that come, we'll spend some time and talk about role clarification, roles and responsibilities. It'll tie into who determined goes on that committee. But for today, it's that group. And what's the date? What's the, what's the date for getting the committee identified and agreement on and commitment on who's on the committee? Not necessarily the first meeting, but you get the committee established. What's the date? September 1st. September 1st? No waiting. I say do it right away. Do it right away. Does, does that mean it still happens? Does it take till September 1st to make it happen? No. I think, I think you can... As fast as you can get it together is when you should get it together. Okay. Because it, it's so I got September 1st. What's another date? Well, I think we should have that in place before we go to Colorado in August. Okay. So you I come to Colorado in the middle of August. A, we have to have a buy-in by all the key players or else a, the trip to Colorado is a waste of time. 
So I think we I think we get this Justice Jail Committee, whatever we want to choose it, get them together as quickly as possible, and make sure that there's a consensus of where we see the direction, the mission, the direction to go. Okay. So 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 give me a different date. July one. July one, August one. I mean September one. July one's fine, but I think there's a difference between these committees. That this is this is a committee that's going to receive the data and review it. It's not a jail citing committee. No. Absolutely, absolutely. So you you are correct. Things in. You are we're correct. Not looking at citing the jail or nope. what we're doing. Nope. This is a group that's going to be receiving the data reviewing it and making recommendations. This, this is a group that is intimately involved in the needs assessment process. Right. Okay, we're in agreement with that. July 1, we got who's who's driving that bus? You got it. Fair enough. Is July 2nd uh, the better date since that's when you're meeting? Does it make a difference? Okay. All right, so we got two things on, on, on the next steps list. What's third? Let me play devil's advocate for, for a moment. Um, many jurisdictions use outside resources. Is that decision, does it rest within the committee? I think Is it an independent decision? How? Well, the, the board's going to have to approve hiring a consultant, but yeah. uh, maybe the justice and jail committee should be the ones that make the recommendation. But you know, we've all I, a lot of people have agreed this should be a data-driven decision. Absolutely. And I don't know how anyone makes a decision without getting a good analysis of the data. And if you go back and look at the Blue Ribbon Commission study, there was a consultant that came yep. in and gave all kinds of statistics about projected jail population, that kind of thing. And I think that has to be done early on in the process. I don't know how we go forward without you know that okay. that happening early on. So, so is, is the task, maybe not necessarily hiring, but is the task evaluating the need for those services? A little bit of a different twist on it. I don't, I don't want to prejudge that you need those services. I, well, I, I suppose the Justice Jail Committee could come to the conclusion that we know enough about our system that uh, we don't need any outside analysis. So you know, maybe, maybe it should happen, but as the third step that... Uh, that that uh, committee decides whether they need a consultant. Would I'd be surprised if they don't. Okay. So so can can we tweak it a little bit and say evaluate the need? Or are you comfortable with just having it as higher? I don't want to put words in your mouth. We'll leave it the way it is. But we have a question over here or a comment. Well, when we talked about a needs assessment, is there actually an assessment tool out there that does that, where all of that data can be plugged into, and there's a you know, you talk about a needs assessment through this whole presentation. What is that? It, the needs assessment is a series of, how can I say it easily? Well, first off, the answer to your question is no, there's not a tool. It's not like a risk assessment instrument for looking at risk to reoffend or anything like that. It's not that um, simple or easy I, I, um, because it's locally driven. The needs assessment is a process where you're, you're collecting lots of information and you're feeding it back to a committee of policymakers to help evaluate what it means, and then you use it as making decisions for the future. Okay, so number three, Who, who's involved in this process? Is it the committee? Yes. The committee is making recommendations, or the commission will have to make the decision. Okay, and and so it's 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 the number two committee, and are we okay calling it the Justice Jail Committee? Is that is that is that the term we want? For right now, fair enough. Yeah, no, 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 no. That I got, I got some, I got some head nodding. Um, and so that committee is involved in that. And finally, any authorization for expenditure of funds, etc., goes to the board. Do you have a date for that? Can you think about a date for that? Uh, you look at it three months, six months. No, no, I, the decision is is to hire, not to complete. So how long does it take for that decision and to implement the decision to hire a person? You have an RFP process typically, or maybe you have professional services where you sole source. I don't know, I don't know what your rules and regulations are. Um, but let me, let me just offer a bias. You, you, 
You are coming in August to a program. I would suggest that this decision doesn't get finalized until you've been to that program. That you've had a chance to digest what, what's occurring. That seems to be... My biggest concern is that we haven't defined what that... Absolutely. We haven't defined the steps in this process um, on what our, you know, you, you gave us a nice flow chart of from arrest to, you know, sentencing and, and post-sentencing. Um, but we, and, and decision points all along the, that, that are part of this needs assessment process. Are we doing everything we can at the arrest yep. level? Are we doing everything, in, you know, when they first appear in court? What are we doing? You know, how can we manipulate these? And that's kind of the step-by-step, -step, I think, that's what you're saying. We're going to step by step analyze what we have going in and what we have coming out and how we can influence that to see if we're doing everything we can do. And also looking at our processes. And so I see that there's a kind of a, a start and a finish to that analysis. And the consultant is somebody who can help us make sure we touch all the bases, to mix in metaphors, yep. um, and make sure we you know make it home. So. Uh, yeah, I think we should wait, okay. but I also think that we need to really clearly establish the purpose of the committee and what its, gonna, what its job is going to be. I've seen too many committees formed that don't have a clear job description, Absolutely. and they end up floundering around, you know, yeah. not getting uh, to the point. Another thing you could find on the NIC website is descriptions of different committees and the responsibilities. Yeah. That's great. And, and, and what we'll do is, is, is Mark and I will make sure that with, with these next steps or recommendations that, that, that you're identifying here, that we add, uh, we add some more detail. It's not going to be just this, this statement up here. We'll add some detail back into there in terms of what we see as uh, steps that you should take, smaller steps underneath this. Because quite honestly, th this whole issue of the committee giving it a charter, a mission, bylaw, you can, you can go through a whole structure of what you want that committee to do. Um, and that's going to be important in the beginning. Uh, because you're right, you'll see committees just just flounder. I mean, it becomes a lunch meeting, and that's all you do. You talk about whether it's the Packers or the Lions, what they did last on Sunday, and that's that, that's what you're focusing on. So, uh, thank you. Uh, clearly, we're not the first um, organization uh, municipality that has gone through deciding what your steps are. Um, uh, so, I guess I don't want to necessarily uh, rein I don't want to reinvent the wheel if I don't have to uh, is there a spot where I can look where other communities have said this was our first step this is our second step um, I like to take a look at how others have done uh, a process successfully and copy them if I can I, I apologize. We had we had a piece at the beginning of oh, this I'm morning. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Let, let me let me let me summarize it on the facility development process, and and that lays out a series of <coughs> steps and phases you'll go through. There's a couple of publications that, that 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 focus on that. That's where communities have been most successful if they have followed those okay. those those decision points through the process. Sorry. Okay. No, no. I was absent. No. I I think I've been absent for a few days. So okay. <laughs> Alrighty. So we got number three. Identifying the need for outside resources. Can we do a number four? So, but the real three is, is pony is before, is before this, right? So this I, 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 I think the final decision, you can, you can have it that, that, you can put down there, Mark, that it's based on pony, that you don't, you don't finalize that decision until you come to pony. And so we would pick a date for the end of that decision as the end of August? September 1. September 1? Now we're, see, we, we got a September 1, okay. Who's involved in that? The committee is involved, but who else? It, it, it requires the board. Do we have the board up there? We have the board up there. The group that went to Pony, are they the Pony team, whatever you want to call it, are they involved in some of that decision maybe? Yes or no? Okay. We, we, we can kind of put them down as a resource. They may not be a decision maker, uh, but they're certainly going to have uh, some, uh, some different opinions potentially when you come back from Colorado. Question. Okay. Do you think we should wait? If we're going to do a request for qualifications or uh, otherwise interview or review the what the abilities of the consultants might be, 
Should we wait to come back from Pony to even write those specs? Uh, I, I would say yes. Okay. Now, there's there's some publications that um, are sample templates for doing those. Okay. Do you have them on your desk? I think there is one. Okay. There are, there are some ones through NIC uh, that are samples, um, and, and they're meant to only be a sample. Uh, but you'll gain more information out at Pony also that may may help solidify that. So yeah, I mean wait, I mean. I don't think it's critical that you take that step right now in terms of making sure you got the consultant on board before you come to Pony. I think there's some significant advantage of waiting. And you may gain some other ideas from other jurisdictions that are there participating with you and when you take the tour. Okay. Okay. I think it's also important to note that probably uh, in November we could be subject to a change of leadership. So oh, you have an election. Yes. <laughs> And so I think some of this probably will start to take place after that election. I mean, we can set the foundation, absolutely, but then let it go into the next election cycle and let them be responsible for carrying the ball the rest of the way. I think that's my phone buzzing over there. Apologize for that. So the, the, the board is up for everybody's looking, and I'm. The board is up in November. Is the chair? No. Two more years. The judges are Prosecuted? okay. Prosecutor is okay, but it's just the commissioners. Okay. Just the commissioners. Yeah. Oh, just those darn commissioners. Yeah. All seven of us. I know all seven of you. So just an interesting so dynamic. Yeah, but I, I have to add, I cannot envision any commissioner, uh, newly elected or otherwise, not willing to educate themselves, and that's what we're talking about here. So I'm not really concerned about that. No, no, and, and, and the reality is, is that you're, you're going to have uh, some tenured folks that are going to stay on. That, that's probably going to be the case. You'll have a little bit of a learning curve, but this has been a fairly public process so far. So between now and November, which is not a long period of time. Um, okay, can we do a number four? It, it, I think you have to involve the public. So it's... Public, it, public Begin the public process, or, or what? A second committee. I think you, at that point you form the citizens committee, get the recommendations to go forward in some type of plan. I, I, I heard, I've, I've heard two different things. One is begin to inform the public. And the other is to form a committee once you've identified what the decision is, so they can be part of. Um, Educating their peers in the community. So I, I've, I've heard I to <laughs> the planning process and the the analysis of what comes out of the the, the consultant's decision and the uh, the uh, recommendations from the justice and jail committee. So, okay. So they provide the input into the process. Yes. Is that the same as, as what you're saying, Sonny, in terms of of? of I, I think that it's important that the the public is is brought in prior to the final recommendation of the jail justice committee and the consultant because they need to hear that information. I you know I there I don't believe that the community as a whole can get buy in when they're told this is what they tell us we need to do. You know, they want to hear from the expertise if you will that Yes, this is, these are your problems. These are the things you're doing well, and these are your these are your shortfalls, and these are the ways that you can you can eliminate or, or reduce your shortfall. So, so, so is the task to develop a public involvement strategy that would involve when they get involved, who gets involved, what's the process for including them in some of the decision making? Is that what I'm hearing? It's, it's, you know, the problem with, you know, involving the public in these kind of processes is, are always difficult in, in giving the public the opportunity to have part of the decision-making process because it's just simply too damn complicated. You know, it, it, it's just, it just takes hours and hours of time to review all the information and, and to have the background of how to make the best decisions. And 
it's difficult to say, okay, I'm going to hold a public hearing and therefore I'm going to inform the public because it doesn't work that way. No. It's too complicated. You can't do a 30-minute presentation on why we need a new jail or why we need to remodel the existing jail. It's too complicated. You know, with those of us in this room have all been involved in this program for a long time, and it's still going to take us six hours to evaluate your, your examination in the last three days. You know, it's too complicated. You can't, you can't just think that you can do a public hearing, public presentation on your needs for a new jail and, and think you've informed the public because it doesn't work. Okay. And then, we get, then we got a question in the back. Oh. No. Uh, I feel the public is a stakeholder in this, and I believe there should be some public involvement in step number two. Okay. Um, if you're looking for a step number four, my opinion is that um, the justice committee, the crim basically criminal justice needs assessment committee, has to produce a report that takes step by step, addresses each step in the decision points, and comes up with uh, what can be done now and what is the long term outlook for all those things. You know, where are we headed? kind of makes a general assessment of what we can do now and what we must do in the future. And do you see that as the committee alone or the committee and the consultant? Or yeah, I see the committee and the consultant. I see the consultant preparing the final report, but I see the committee coming to some kind of, well, agreements in some areas and maybe disagreements in other areas, um, but then that being the instrument for getting to the next step beyond number four, which is now what are we going to do? Okay. So, so, so let, me, let, me do, let me do two things. Let me close the loop on, on this issue about public involvement because what I've heard is that th there, there's a, a conversation, a discussion up here with this group about membership and when you involve the public and how often and frequent. And so, and so it goes up here in, into this task. There's a, there's a policy decision about Who's sitting on the committee and bringing the public in? I believe that 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 absent a committee absent the public on a process like this creates um, difficulty for you. That that but you've got to balance how they get involved in that process, and so we'll make sure that we capture some discussion about public involvement up here in our report. And then what I heard is number four is that as we've gone through this, this is really doing the needs assessment. Um, and, and it's completing that report. And, and so the question, if, if, it, if we could use that paraphrase, what's your, what's your horizon for getting that done? Recognizing there's an election in November, you gotta go through you know, some process for hiring and selecting and doing all that kind of stuff. Do you have a date that you're trying to target for from a budget standpoint, from a public process standpoint? Are you looking at you know, March of next year, January of next year, December of this year. What's your, what's your realistic target? Recognizing decision making can be deliberate. You kind of have to know. You got to. You have to know how long it takes to get through each step of those. Yeah. Each decision point and how long it takes that. Do you have a committee to, to do its work? Do you have an urgency to get something done? Do you have a need to have something done quickly? No. Okay. So let me offer this. That, that, that you don't put a date on this yet. Because you don't know everything about how long it's going to take. But you know it's your next step. It's that final step there. We can identify who's participating in it because it's, it's, it's this group up here and other folks that are there. We know there are certain steps that are going to be undertaken to complete that. But let it, let it percolate a little bit. I'm a firm believer in establishing end dates because if you don't do an establish an end date, it can take forever. But for today's purposes, you may not know enough to establish that milestone end date at this point in time. You don't have a crisis in your facility in terms of a wall crumbling down. You're not that house wherever it was on some lake that was that's ready to fall into to, to the water that I saw because a cliff fell down. You're, you're not that. Um, but it doesn't mean that you delay decision making either as a part of this process. But let the group kind of figure out what that date is. It also doesn't mean they have to wait till this is done to make any changes. Right. Exactly. And the 
consultant, you could start talking about uh, some some uh, system-wide changes to alleviate crowding. It, it, it is not uncommon to see a couple of tracks coming out of this needs assessment where we have policy issues, things that can be done relatively quickly that are low budget impacts, and you make them as your tier one kind of stuff while you're working on physical plant issues and you continue to work on that, and those take longer because it's brick and mortar solutions. So you take these two tracks and you have them working as companions to each other. We're also going to be going into a budget process now. <clears throat> so someplace in here we have to establish a budget for this particular organization or this group as to how much we're going to put and how we're going to fund it. So what, what's your budget cycle? Uh, it has to be established before the end of October. Okay. So, you know, so that we just, we're going to have that discussion here you know, with coming rather shortly. You, you, you're you're going to have it as it relates to the committee and yep. to outside resources. You're going to have to put some kind of a line item together. Right. Fair enough. Bob says he has in his budget. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I don't think so. Nobody in my budget if you put it there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your overtime under control and we can cover it. I know. It, it, <laughs> gosh. Okay. I, I want to stress that there is a difference between, as I see it, what the Justice Jail Committee is going to do and what, if you want to call it a blue ribbon committee with more citizen involvement uh, does. And I, I certainly believe the public has to be involved uh, in this process. Uh, th these are complicated issues. You know, most people, when you say, well, we want to build a new jail, they think, oh, you just want to lock more people up. But they, they don't know about some of the things that have been talked about here, such as, uh, you know, if we had a work release that was part of the jail, we could have more people out working during the day, uh, and, and that would be a great thing. Or we could have a prisoner uh, reentry program that was through the jail, and uh, that would get more uh, inmates incorporated back into society and become working, productive uh, citizens. Uh, so th there are a lot of facets to this whole question. Absolutely. Um, but the, the difference as I see it is that with the Justice Jail Committee, you're talking about uh, you know, the judges in particular, whether they're going to be flexible on some of their decision making. You know, if the judges uh, say, well, we'll just expand our community corrections program, we'll double the capacity, and there goes the problem, I suppose you don't have to go any further with it. Absolutely. But if they are uh, adamantly opposed to that, they feel they've done everything they could to expand community corrections and we're at the tipping point, then uh, there, there's no reason to go any further with that. And that's something that is within their purview. Yep. There, there's no uh, changing that. So uh, limited public involvement, uh, you know, I, I think maybe having a citizen member of that committee makes some, some sense. Uh, but if you end up with a committee like uh, Sonny was talking about with a Blue Ribbon Committee of 25 people, you know, I, I think that's just going to be chaos. I, I think that's what should happen further down the road uh, when uh, you know we're trying to make decisions about how to or, or what what uh, what we want to go forward. It is a tough balance, um, and I'm not envious of, of, of that challenge to to you all. And, and, and you, you, many of you are are public servants, for lack of a better word. You're elected by the citizens, and, and you serve at their pleasure. Um, and so you have an obligation for that, but then how do you balance that, that public involvement in some of the decision making that they've entrusted you with? And that's, that's the real, real balance. And so um, I think that's going to be a big conversation that you're going to have as you go forward. You've got a track record of history of what you've done with the previous project, and so you build on that. You know things that didn't work exactly how you wanted to do it before and things that might have been very positive, and, that, and, and that's how you go forward. So. So that, that is a tough one. Two, two ways of involving the, the public that I've been involved in before that I've been Two ways, two other ways that I've, that, um, that I see has worked when I've done needs assessments for, for other counties are a series of, of uh, public meetings where, where um, the consultant presents data, talks about different options, 
Um, and that starts usually pretty er relatively early in the needs assessment process because otherwise uh, the public is likely to say, oh, you know, you've already decided everything, you don't really value our input. Um, so I, th I, I suggest that that start relatively er early on um, some, some public, public meetings or public presentations. Another thing that, um, that, that uh, we and others have, have done is, is um, write um, sort of progress reports or summaries of, of portions of, of, of what, what, uh, what's produced like it part of the inmate profile or an analysis of alternatives to incarceration or whatever and have a link um, on the county website to that so to keep public informed and then you know then it's harder for them then they can't really say that the, that they're not informed by by making efforts like that that aren't that uh, time consuming or kind of have one of those darn smartphones. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks for allowing us to come into your county for a few days. Enjoy your hospitality. Um, and and your. It, it, it has been a real enjoyment for us. Um, this is one of those communities that you drive into, you say, boy, it really feels kind of good here, you know? Um, there, there's a nice tone about, about the community. We, we appreciate your involvement in, in letting us disrupt your days for, for, for a few days um, because we know that we are intrusive. I mean, we have to schedule things and we're showing up and we're asking for additional pieces of data you have to send emails at 7:30 in the morning and um, but we really really appreciate it Todd gets a phone call from me late in the afternoon and Captain Hall got an email from me early this morning um, so we, we, re we really appreciate your your involvement and your participation special thanks to Captain Hall for coordinating all of this and pulling it all together um, we know how um, how tough that can be um, thanks for lunch thanks for uh, the ability to use your, use your space and uh, we look forward to I look forward to seeing a few of you in Colorado in, in, in a couple of months um, I'll be one of the instructors in that four day program um, and so just thanks a bunch Mark um, basically ditto thank you very much you've been a great group to, to work with thanks um, for your support and your input and a ton of data that you provided before even before we got here and then getting more data while I've been here. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, we apologize for the less than stellar weather. <laughs> oh, it, yeah. You know, living in Colorado, uh, where humidity averages are sometimes 25%, um, uh, my hair's a little thicker when I come back to something like this, so it's nice. So we, uh, we appreciate it. So, Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs> There was no snow. That was fantastic. So we we we, we, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thanks for not a problem. Very interesting. Good. We've, well, we've heard many compliments about how you're making the system better. Oh, you did. Yeah. I won't ask about the credit systems. <laughs> no, no, okay. All right. Okay. He's an extraordinary prosecutor. Everybody likes him. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> Thank you.